Thank you. As we work to ensure that our public participation is responsive to our community's needs, as well as those of the boards to conduct business in an orderly and efficient manner, we ask that those wishing to speak at public comment sign in now in advance of the meeting. Is there anybody that wishes to speak that hasn't signed in yet? Kyle, would you grab the sheet? Thank you. Thank you. And next is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So the minutes of our March meetings have been provided to the board members. Does anybody have any corrections to the minutes? Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? You so moved. And a second. Second. All in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Next item is approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? May I have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Thank you. A second? Second. Okay. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That motion carries. <clears throat> Dr. Fine. Yes, we'd love to start this evening with some student recognition, which is the best part of our meeting. We're going to start with uh, Cooper Dennison. Cooper, if you want to sneak up to the podium, uh, we want to honor and recognize Cooper. Cooper is a senior, and he is a legendary trombone player. Uh, he has been playing the trombone for nine years, and Liam auditioned for the All-State Orchestra your junior year uh, for acceptance into the symphony your senior year. Cooper is a member of the Columbus Youth Symphony Orchestra Trombone Section and was a previous member of the Columbus Youth Symphonic Band for several years. Cooper has performed for numerous OMEA solo and ensemble contests. And in these contests, he has received superior ratings. He will be double majoring next year in trombone performance and political science from American University in Washington, DC and under Cooper's leadership, he has mentored and tutored the trombone section in multiple classes, including concert and marching band. Uh, you have done such a phenomenal job. He also traveled, I think, to Cleveland during the snowstorm and put on an incredible show. I was bummed to miss it because I think you got there the day before the storm hit. Yeah. Uh, you are a superstar. We are really proud of your accomplishments, and uh, we're glad you're here tonight. Is there anything you'd like to say, introduce uh, your family that you brought with you? Awesome. We're proud of you. That's a big deal and well done. What we're going to do is take a picture with the Board of Education. We'll sneak right up to the front. Thank you. Well, I think we're just doing it. Okay. All right, here we go. Second, we'd like to bring up freshman phenom, Millie Evans. Our swim, yeah, for swimming. Are our coaches, swimming coaches, uh, mm -hmm. there you are. Come on, if you wanna join Millie, that'd be great. So Sandy and Millie, we uh, want to compliment all of your work for uh, this past season. Millie Evans placed second in the state championship at the 100 yard butterfly. She set a school record of 54.49 seconds. And for those that don't know swimming, that is fast. At the uh, 2022 OHSAA Division II Swimming State Championships, you were also part of three new relay records 
and you lowered the 200 IM record in the state finals where you finished ninth. You are only a freshman, but has matriculated to the team well in the second half of the season. You swam also in the US Junior Nationals in December, and you continue to push to go to higher levels with your skills. Uh, your coaches say they are very excited for the many great things ahead. And I said to your grandparents, I am so excited we get three more years of excitement. So we are really proud of you, Millie. Uh, anything you'd like to say, introduce the friends that, and family that came with you. Um, I brought my grandparents and parents and I want to thank them for supporting me. And I want to thank the support I got from my team and coaches and also to hopefully continue to improve something and bring down the records more. I love it. Well done. Thank you. Here we go. Good job. Proud of you. Oh, yeah, thank you. And our next swimmer, Nicholas Minkin, I believe walked in. Yes, there he is. My friend Nicholas placed sixth in the 100 yard freestyle and seventh in the 100 yard backstroke at the 22 OHSAA division two swimming state championships. You also set a new record in both of those events. Uh, you have worked incredibly hard and your extreme focus on what you want to accomplish is uh, remarkable. And your coaches speak very highly of you as a person and also as an athlete. You are also one of our captains this year as a junior and is one of the spiritual leaders on the team. You bring high energy and great encouragement for all the levels of swimmers that we have. And your coaches speak uh, eloquently that you represent the community and you push all of us to be a step better throughout the process. That's a big deal. So we're really proud of you. It is a big accomplishment. If you would take a second and introduce who you brought with us and anything else you'd like to add. Um, I brought my parents with me, um, Matt and Becky, and I'd like to thank my parents for their support, um, Sandy and Mitch. Um, and just this team, I feel like we were really close this year and it helped everybody. I love it. Well done. Proud of you. Good work. All right, here we go. And now our cheerleaders are gonna sneak in from the back. We are recognizing our 2022 OASSA Division Three Game Day Blue and Traditional White Building Cheer State Champions. This crew has done a lot uh, in the last several years, but we're gonna compliment and, and talk about a couple of things. There are 27 cheerleaders between the two squads. Uh, their coaches, uh, Brooke and Lizzie and Whitney are a huge part of their success, and I saw the coaches here as well. Uh, a couple of highlights from the year. You were 2022 OASSA state champs. Our traditional white division three building is three years in a row, and they won that competition, which I think I was at, by 34 points, which was impressive. Game day blue division three game day building, back-to-back -back champions, they won by 40 points. And when I was there, it wasn't even close. Game Day Blue won the first ever MSL competition this year in the Ohio division. And every single one of our nine seniors, so seniors, raise your hand. Some of our seniors are here with us. Every single one of our nine seniors has won at least two state titles or more. And four of our seniors have won all five state titles. The two teams have included several individual awards and coach Brooke Wojcik was named our MSL Ohio coach of the year, which is a big deal. I can't see her, but I, I know she's here. Yeah. So that's a big deal. They've had a long season. I believe all of our team members cheer at least one season of sideline and many do both in addition to competition. That's, that's a lot of work. And uh, having been in the gym a lot for the, as a basketball parent, it was really impressive to see, uh, your work on the sideline, but then also in competition. I think this is an important aspect. Our team average 
uh, from our cheerleading squad has a GPA of 3.75. So you do it on the sidelines and you do it in the classroom, that's a big deal. So congratulations to our, our cheerleaders. Coach, or any of our coaches, anything you'd like to add? Definitely wanted to say thank you for being there that morning. It was super early in the morning and we don't, we don't get a lot of spectators sometimes. <laughs> we were really thankful for you being there and just getting to hang out with us and watch us bring home another one. Yeah, it was amazing. I, it was really impressive. I, I told everybody that day, if you've never been to one of those competitions, you got to get there. It was amazing. So well done. Thank you, coaches. Thank you, uh, cheerleaders. We'll take a picture. Scooting as much as you can. All right, here we go. Perfect. Honor to recognize. So amazing when you see like what that cheer program, like when Liana came into the cheer program in middle school, it was if, yeah, and the middle school had four um, and for it to be like, she usually has close to 60 some girls try out. So it's really, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and she still, she still is like really engaged with her cheerleaders once they graduate. <clears throat> Okay, we are up to the uh, board reports. Um, I'm going to try to be brief. I'm starting, it's not a board report. I just want to give a shout out to Jonathan and the BMPA for the really great Circle of Excellence event. It was lovely. I thought it was a great keynote and the whole event. I'm so glad that we're doing that. You're doing that. Great job. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna start with the legislative stuff as the legislative liaison to the OSBA. Last month, I reported on House Bill 51. That's the one that contains a provision that allows a public body, including a board of education to temporarily meet remotely and permits individual board members to attend and vote remotely at an otherwise in-person meeting. So one of the, um, one of the um, policies that we're going to look at tonight involves a resolution that the board has seen, everybody's seen that, to just adopt those changes in House Bill 51. They expire by their own terms at the end of June, so it'll be short. Um, next up is a um, quick update on House Bill 126. We've been reporting on this one. This is the one that Kyle has been in particular following for us. In its original form, House Bill 126 placed certain limitations on the process for po political subdivisions like a school board, a school district to contest the value of properties not owned by the district for purposes of property tax. Um, the bill went to conference committee and has came out quickly in its final form and was adopted and is now on its way to the governor for signature. In its final form, it severely limits a school district's ability to protect its tax base through board revision, board of revision. So very briefly, it prohibits boards of education from filing residential and agricultural complaints. It permits a board of education to file a commercial complaint, but only a you know, commercial property, a complaint with respect to commercial property. And those are limited as to time and amount. Uh, the bill requires a board to provide notice and pass a resolution for each parcel with the notice going to the tax address and mailing address. 
The board would have to give notice to property owners at least seven days in advance when they plan to vote on the resolution authorizing a valuation change, but it eliminates notice to the board when um, mm. there's a counterclaim or a counter complaint, which means that the board will no longer receive notice from the county auditor when a complaint is filed. Districts will have to file counter complaints within 30 days of the date the owner files the original complaint. Property owners still receive notice of the, of, the, of a board's complaint and have 30 days from receipt of that notice to file a counter complaint. The bill bans private pay settlement agreements um, and it provides that the Board of Revision must dismiss a case if the Board of Revision hasn't acted on that case within one year. It also prohibits a board from filing an appeal of a Board of Revision decision. Um, Kyle and I haven't had a chance to talk about that, so I'm, he may want to say something about it. Um, I'm going to give a quick update in respect to House Bill 327. I reported on that at our last meeting, and that's the bill that um, relates to teaching or promotion of certain so-called divisive concepts. Joanne asked about the impact of, of this bill on advanced placement courses, and I promised to provide an update. So in March, um, the College Board, which is the organization that oversees AP, um, posted on its website and sent out to AP teachers a statement called what AP stands for. That document provides an overview of AP program principles um, and the introductory paragraph includes a statement that, quote, the principles are designed to ensure that teachers' expertise is respected, required course content is understood, and that students are academically challenged and free to make up their own minds, end quote. The statement includes that AP opposes censorship, and it says on that, quote, AP is animated by a deep respect for intellectual freedom of teachers and students alike. If a school bans required topics from their AP courses, the AP program removes the AP designation from that course and its inclusion in the AP course ledger provided to colleges and universities. And I'm still quoting, for example, the concepts of evolution are at the heart of college biology and a course that neglects such concepts does not pass muster as AP biology. The statement that was released by the College Board also provides that AB opposes indoctrination and AP is an unflinching encounter with evidence and other similar statements. So I believe that the best way to understand the possible impact of the proposed legislation on AP courses is to understand that if required curricular content it, for an AP course is banned at a school, as it possibly could be by this legislation, then the college board may decide to no longer give AP credit for that, for that course. Um, that seems like the kind of straightforward answer to the question that Joanne posed. The more, um, you know, de detailed thinking about it brings me to realize that if an AP teacher is just made to feel uncomfortable by this legislation and there's something that's required in the AP course curriculum that they don't feel comfortable teaching, the same thing could happen. They could just decide not to, you know, even if it hasn't been banned, um, they could take the position that they're not going to say something about something because they feel threatened by, um, you know, the, the remedies in the legislation if it were to pass. So it is possible that um, there could be an impact. I continue to think that what AP is saying is we're not going to, they don't, they don't um, seem to be saying that they want to pull any AP courses. I don't see this legislation as really necessarily pulling away, banning um, materials that are required, but these kinds of questions are the reasons we need to continue to monitor and be concerned about this legislation and these issues. Um, I'm gonna give a quick update on some other newly introduced bills of significance to our board. Um, 
And I'll start with the related bill. You all may have seen that on April 4th, um, House Bill 616 was introduced into our legislation that's offered and referred to as don't say gay legislation. House Bill 616 would um, prohibit the teaching of certain divisive or inherently racist concepts in public schools. It would prohibit the training or administration of professional development to employees that promote or endorse divisive or inherently racist concepts. It would prohibit K through third grade students from being provided any instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity. It would prohibit grade four through 12 students from being provided any instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in any manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate in accordance with state standards. It would allow complaints to be filed with the State Board of Education, and it would provide for withholding of funding for non-compliance with the bill's provisions. Um, House Bill 601 introduced um, has also been introduced, and it would increase state teacher retirement system and school employee retirement system employer contributions from 14% to 18%. It would, that would be phased in over eight years. It would require the STRS board to annually institute a cost of living adjustment. It would prohibit STRS from reducing COLA cost of living adjustments below 1% for certain contribution levels. And it would eliminate a requirement that an STRS member be at least 60 to be eligible for an unreduced retirement benefit. Um, last, Senate Bill 308 introduced, um, was introduced to prohibit state and local governments, including steel districts, from investing in granting incentives to or contracting with Russia or companies based in Russia. It would require STRS and SERS and, and the Bureau of Workers' Comp, among others, to divest from those holdings and um, identified companies that are based in Russia. Um, that's the first part of my update. That's legislative update. Any questions on any of that? Um, Ms. Powers, I am curious how House Bill 616 impacts our, um, our current, is it in, um, is it up for debate? Where is it right now? So it is at the very beginning of a process and it's always impossible for us to know how that bill will move what will happen. It just was introduced on April 4th. So it's just, just in very commonly what happens next is the legislative, you know, the people who introduced the bill would give proponent testimony about it. They may then give, have an, an, another time for people to come in to give a proponent testimony. Then they might look for opponent testimony. So it, there'll be typically there's a process like that. This is very, um, you know, it of course uh, heavily overlaps with 327 that we've been talking about. It's much shorter. It's um, they call this the compromise. No, there's no compromise in yeah. this. No, well, no. I'm just concerned about its impact on our equity and inclusion. Um, yeah, policies and right. initiatives, and are school districts not able to? Well, I guess our OSBA um, platform does whatever it tries to do. And, and it, it will oppose this, sure. this legislation for sure. Um, we have every right as a school board and each of us as individual board members to provide, um, you know, what would be considered testimony, but you can just provide it in writing mm -hmm. um, to oppose the bill. There, my experience with that is that the window goes up and down pretty quickly. And I, I've i been known to miss those windows. So you got to really, I, I sign up to get alerts. Mm -hmm. And when they come, it's like the, the stuff's due tomorrow. You know, it's tough. So um, I, I imagine that, you know, so when three, House Bill 327 that addressed much of that didn't have the, you know, it's not the don't say gay legislation, but a lot of it is similar. When they finally opened that up for opposition testimony, they had a lot of people come in, a lot. The Ohio Department of Education, you know, lot, all the different 
education organization can have extreme impacts against our teaching staff too sure yeah. it's part of that same concern mm -hmm. that you know was so partly addressed in the discussion about the ap mm -hmm. so um, i i do have a question about the uh the counterclaim notice so we are in what is that house bill 126 yeah so we are obligated to give notice but they but they don't, don't have to provide to us that's right a counterclaim and is it, did I ha have that right? It's a seven day window to try to. We have 30 days from the date of the filing to file a counterclaim, but we don't, but you get don't know that it's happening. So you basically and when have we to give watch notice, for it. we give no, when we, when we were to, if we were to file something, we do have to give notice and their time runs from the time that they get the notice. So it's, it's, you know, the seven days is, um, we have to give we have to give seven days notice of the time if we were to we can't do anything unless we as a board adopt a resolution that we're going to do that around filing a complaint and we have to give seven days notice of our intention to get together to to do that is there a mechanism mr smith um to be able to get alerts i know like um uh, the mechanism would be public records request on a daily basis I was thinking about that question. I have never it, felt more deflated. <laughs> I, know, I, know. I, I was wondering if we could do it like every, if we could have a search done every 25 days or something, because then we would at least, I mean, it's crazy. But if you pick something up on the 25th day, you'd have five days to right. um, mm -hmm. file, which would not be within a seven day notice window. Oh, right. That's um, right. So That's right. I imagine so we'll- So essentially the barriers are designed to you know, it's sort of like a placate. We've given you a, an opportunity to to counterclaim this, but really there are so many barriers to even issue a counterclaim. It, it just makes me... It, it'd be difficult. Um, it won't impact yeah, us possibly. greatly, but it impacts education across the state. Um, at the end of the day, it makes everybody else pay more um, or carry more of a burden mm -hmm. on the tax base. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have any other questions. I'm sorry. Anyone else? I just want to thank you for the thorough um, information. That's it was a lot to look at to answer Joanne's question. So thank you. a lot. Thank you. Sorry to be long winded. So I do have one other topic um, and I will shorten it, which is um, the superintendent's policy committee met and I forgot to put it on the agenda, but I'll give a quick update on it. Um, I really want to thank the team that helped with the review of the policies that are on for a first reading tonight. That included the superintendent, the treasurer, deputy superintendent, director of curriculum and gifted, leader of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and fellow board member, Joanne Pickrell. Um, with one exception, the policies that we are reviewing this month um, the updates as a first reading contain changes that have been recommended to us by the OSBA as a result of changes in underlying law. Our district relies on the OSBA to flag for us changes in the law that require or might suggest changes to our policies. Additional changes to these policies are included mostly just to provide consistency around references to parent slash guardian, pronoun usage, consistent use of usage of terms such as district office versus central office and just for clarity. The policy that contains revisions that did not come from the OSBA that we're looking at tonight is policy IGBB. That is updated to reflect the recently adopted changes to our gifted programming. Pretty much everything else in that policy is language that's straight out of Ohio law. In all of the policies, changes to our current policies are shown in what we look at in green language showing proposed additions and in red strikeouts showing proposed deletions. Um, I already mentioned that we're going to also look at um, just suspending the requirement that we be in person um, through June 30th by an, um, a resolution that would, I'll get it. Thank you. Thank you so much. No notes. Um, our two board policies, BD, which is our meeting policy, and BDDF, which is our voting policy. 
And I think that's all I got. Any questions on that? Thank you. I'll go next to Alicia. Yes. Um, so I was not able to attend Bravo. I was attending to my mom that night, but um, the final numbers haven't been reported yet. They're on track to um, have reached 100,000 uh, in donations and gifts. So we're really excited about that. Um, they just had their deadline to nominate Educator of the Year Award. Uh, and I remind me to... Um, Friend of Education Award um, after. Um, and those submissions were due last week. So we'll be, um, they'll convene a, a group of folks to review those um, nominations. I had an, a, the pleasure a few times to sit on that uh, committee and it's, it's hard work because you are really uh, weighing well-deserved individuals. <laughs> like, in fact, it's hard to choose um, in it, just one. Uh, you want to take them all. So we'll be anxious to uh, hear um, who wins that uh, recognition. Um, the BEF generously donated $100,000 to Bexley City Schools uh, towards lighting and sound upgrades to the Schottenstein the Theater. It's been a while. Uh, it's well well uh, needed and still will be excited to um, enjoy the benefits of that with our incredible theater arts program. I may sound biased since I have a theater kid now, but um, it's a pretty good program. Uh, we received $75,000 from Jay and Jenny Schottenstein's foundation and $25,000 from the BEF grant. So it's always great to hear um, those dollars being earmarked and uh, we thank the Education Foundation. We could not do a lot of what we do to this day without their support. Um, students in Ms. Mallory's class enjoyed a, a seminar from Dr. Jeffrey Weidlinger on the Holocaust. Um, and so that was a really great um, uh, offering. We have not had a finance advisory meeting. That's next week, so I'll report out in our May meeting. Um, no facilities meetings for, for me to date, I, not to give you more to do, Dr. Fine. <laughs> Let's get it going. No, I'm kidding. Um, and then I just have some outside of board committee updates. Um, the final steering committee meetings for the Livingston Avenue corridor um, uh, improvement are scheduled. I just finally submitted my doodle poll um attendance so once that meeting is set i'll report out that information in may and then the bexley uh city uh police youth interaction policy subcommittee meets tomorrow but i actually won't be in attendance for that because of work so they are going to send me the updates on that and i'll report out uh, on on that information uh and then last but not least um to our new uh board members um we annually award uh, a friend of education award that's uh, from the Bexley um, School Board and we have not even circulated. Oh, excuse me, sorry, I jumped the gun. I got all, you could have told me that. <laughs> Next month, <laughs> sorry. I was just panicking because we always wait and, and then it's a rush and yeah, it just reminded me when I had the BEF one. So, all right, well, I'll shut up now. Sorry, guys. I have nothing else. Good, thank you. Mm. Uh, the athletic board did not meet this uh, last month, so I have nothing else new to report. So much in athletics right now. I don't even know how you pick and choose. We got a mulch, a lot of mulch. Did going you on. happen to see that uh, the Ohio Athletic Association is weighing whether or not to um, allow? um student likeness and images to be paid. nil yeah is it um, NIL? is that what name it is? image likeness yeah uh, for high school so I, I when that comes out we'll see how that plays yeah out. i'll be interested to hear what you um report cool. out on it i'll be looking for it so i mean it was actually i because i want to be cool like jonathan <laughs> So, <laughs> Nobody can be as cool as Jack. I know. It's, I'm, I'm <laughs> and so I, uh, 
And yeah, so I think this was actually the day after I left work. It took me quite a while. So this none of this information is told me. Um, that in general, the conversations were around mass policy to be done, you know, transition to the transition to the ground. What there was was a notice in sort of the shift of, of those energies that were being, the energies that were being exerted around masking policy have shifted to school lunches and um, concerns around equity initiatives. So there's a, a trend across um, several districts in Franklin County. Um, and with some of the districts funding and folks others funding some initiatives to target specifically school lunches. Mm. Um, and so that was sort of the general, it was really just a, you know, what's going on in the districts. It's good to see that we're not the only ones that are, you know, on the constant barrage of public uh, yeah. records yeah. requests. Not that that's bad. It's just the cons the amount of time that it consumes and and what have you. So that's interesting that that's happening everywhere. Yeah, and it was funny that section because uh, Victoria and I both sit on this committee, and so we were trying to decide what was worth talking about. And we and it's good to know that we're not alone. <laughs> Right. And there was and I actually texted Kyle from the meeting because there was a concern that came up at another district where a lot of student data was shared oh. um, by accident. And so I was like, hey, are you sure that? <laughs> so it was good. It's good to just have yeah. that information sort of cross district. You know, what are yeah. some things that are happening so that I think it was helpful. But there was a lot of conversation about public record requests can and you, just the time. Can you tell me what the opposition around school lunches? What, what what's The quality about? of school uh, lunches. Hmm. It was school lunch has been good. that was a mm. yeah that was a yes it was yeah. the quality right yeah um so mm. those were the those were the trends of that meeting mm. and I'm also on the um uh mission vision and planning and we haven't yet set a date for that one but we Jason and I've talked about it a couple yeah. times so. great okay thank you so thank you so much uh Joanne Yes, so the Bexley Recreation Board met um, last week. During the meeting, we discussed a lot about pool operations and summer camp. As you know, a lot of our students are involved in the, not only the before and after school program, but also their summer camp program. We also discussed um, the Commonwealth Park, sorry, master plan. Um, they are started work on, there's two athletic fields on that park. They've started work on the west side. They're going to start work on the east side, which may impact some of our programming, which I talked to Dr. Fine about, mostly on our practice fields. Um, and then the summer brochure, as you know, many of us found in the mail today, that opens up on April 25th. Um, also on summer programs, if you know a um, person who wants to have a seasonal job with the rec department, please apply. There are still openings. We like to get those filled. And then as many people know in the room, Barb Griner, who has been a Parks and Recs employee for over 30 years, retired. Uh, she's always been an advocate, not only for the rec department, but for expanding programs as parents and students and seniors wanted more programming. She is going to be also working part-time now over at the Senior Center, which is a passion for her and helping to expand those programs. I know she'll be greatly missed. She was always just someone who took your phone call and tried to help you figure it out. So um, absolutely, yes, uh, um, so she'll be greatly missed and they have filled two positions to cover really her one position. So, but she's still gonna remain involved. So right. congratulations to her. <laughs> Thank you. Quinn, do you have a report? Thank you. Um, yeah, I just have a few updates from the high school. Um, last Friday, uh, we had student council uh, presidential elections for next year. And I'm excited to say that James McCann will be the next student council president of Bexley High School. I know him well, I've known him for a while and I have great faith in him to lead student council next year. And you guys will meet him here soon. Um, in the upcoming weeks, the uh, current executive board members, James and I will be reviewing uh, and interviewing candidates, reviewing applications and interviewing candidates for next year's uh, executive board. Um, on the event side, student council will be hosting a game night um, on April 29th in the high school library. And we will also be having another class of the classes event, which we, we held a similar event in the fall, but we're going to do it this time outside and towards the end of the school year in May. We haven't locked down in uh, official date yet, but it will be in May towards the end of the school year. That's all I have. Great. Thank you so much. Any questions? When is prom? 
Prom is, well, student council is not involved in planning prom, but I'm pretty sure it's May 9th. It's that, sa it's that Saturday. Seven. Seventh, sorry. Yep. I just need to know for tux rental purposes because I can't seem to get a straight answer. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, he, he goes on. And when is Quinn's last day in this setting? What month? So I was, th I still need to talk to James about this. I was assuming that I would come to the May meeting. And then after that, he would start coming. Cause I think that's what I did last year. Right. I think, I think my first meeting was in June of last year. So I'll have a conversation with him about that and I'll send you an Great. email, let you know. So one more month. All right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Next. Over yep. You. Thank you. Brad's going to help me with uh, some slides. Thank you, Quinn, as always. Great job. I'm excited to have James join us, but you will be sorely missed and we'll give you your send off next month. Uh, just April celebrations. You've mentioned a couple of things, some wonderful things happening throughout the district, but one that uh, I think we've done uh, some work around is making sure that each month uh, celebrations take place driven by students and uh, with the assistance of our leader of diversity, equity, inclusion, Marcellus Braxton. Uh, recently, we sent out communication to the staff and students uh, regarding Arab American Heritage Month and opportunities and supports. It's also School Library Month and other things, uh, but lots happening in our district that I'm really thankful for. We will move to our athletic facilities update. We've talked about this for the last several months. Things continue to move forward. We continue to hold conversations with the Jewish Community Center about the possibility of enhanced athletic facilities uh, for our students on their property. We are currently entering the feasibility study or stage of this project to determine the options of the site. So we will continue to update you. I believe Kyle and I have a meeting coming up in the very near future. So uh, some design phases occurring here shortly that we will be able to share with the board. Any questions on either of those two items? A mixed emotion for us here at Bexley, Susan Drake, our amazing principal at Maryland uh, Elementary. Uh, she has recently accepted a role as the director of operations for a nonprofit organization. This is obviously bittersweet for us. Uh, she is a superstar. She is incredible. She is a light of energy at Maryland. Uh, we were there I think last Friday, she was in the middle of dealing with uh, supporting students at the time that we were ushering her into the library so that she could share with her staff. And that was obviously an emotional moment for everyone involved. Uh, we are so thankful for her impact on that community as an instructional leader, but also most importantly, as a, a connection and a relationship builder. Uh, I'm really thankful that she is re uh, committed to remaining at Maryland through the end of the year. I think uh, you'll see on the approval. I think her final day would be June 17th, I believe. Uh, so we appreciate her willingness to stay put and continue fighting for students and staff. Uh, and she will be able to assist us with our transition plan. We will be communicating very soon in the near future, perhaps in the next 24 hours, a process that we will undertake to find our next replacement. So we're excited to go through that process. Um, but it is tough when you lose somebody like Susan Drake. So happy to answer any questions about Susan. I was just going to say, you know, it, it is a, a hard pill to swallow when um, a talent like that leaves us, but what a great um, testament to finding your second act. And I hope that um, students kind of take that um, example that, you know, you can do something for yeah. so long and, and it be a passion uh, for you. And then to have an opportunity to pursue another passion in life after having such a, a great career, yeah. it's a really great step. So I wish her the very best. I know she'll do a great job. Thank you. And I would just like to say she has been my daughter's principal for the last three years. And she is um, really amazing. We'll be sad to see her go, but I think if you spend time in that building, you will see that she's not a principal that stays, and I don't think any really of our principals do that when you walk around our buildings, but she's out. She's the principal who participates in gym class with <coughs> children. She's out at when kids come in in the morning, when kids leave in the afternoon. Um, so I know we'll miss her. She's a great leader, and I think the students just really enjoy being with her too. And she started some great new traditions there that I hope will live on too. 
But we wish her well, but I'll be one of the families that will miss her. Love it. We will definitely miss her. She's been fantastic. Yeah. So I appreciate that. And one other thing that I think is just a testament of who she is. It is really hard. And I'm sure we've all been in the situation. I was almost a year ago when you are in a new position that you know you are going to embark on. It is really challenging to have your full energy into the, the position you're in and to watch Susan do that. Uh, recently has been really impressive and she is committed to doing the work uh, here and she has told the next stop she will be there when she gets there. So that's really impressive and I'm really thankful for that approach. Yeah, I'm very, uh, just, uh, I'll miss Susan too, uh, just having been a parent who was on a search committee that hired her uh, before I was on the board. And just as my oldest, my youngest kid was at Maryland as a fifth grader in her first year. And just seeing how she in, kind of wrapped her arms around the, the community uh, who had been used to a certain way for a while, if you will. And she still kind of brought her her stamp. And uh, I think she did a great job during the pandemic trying to really uh, rally around that, uh, rally that school. So we saw it from afar. We only, we only live two blocks from Maryland, but we saw it kind of from afar as well. So we were gonna miss Susan. Thank you. Continuing along the lines of uh, mixed emotions, uh, Tyler Trill, our public information officer is also resigning. Uh, we want to thank him for his, his service. Uh, he is pursuing opportunities outside of uh, the state uh, and outside of education. So we're really excited for what's ahead for Tyler, but that's a, a big loss for us. Uh, he has had such an incredible uh, creative mind as he approaches his work, and he faced some real challenges during uh, COVID and, and other scenarios. Uh, and I'm thankful for the time that I had to spend with him. He was always willing to to step in and, and get things done. Uh, his final day in Bexley will be effective Wednesday, the 20th of April. Uh, some background information, as many of you know, in addition to our current public information officer position, uh, the district has also contracted, contracted communication services through Allerton Hill. Gianna Harrison from Allerton Hill will take over some of the public information officer duties until we find Tyler's replacement. We'll talk about that in a minute. Gianna is very familiar with Bexley and has helped support the district's communication uh, efforts for a few years. She's very knowledgeable about Bexley and the school community and will do a wonderful job assisting us uh, alongside our leadership team members as we move forward. Uh, big shout out to Brad Pettit. You saw Brad taking our photos tonight. Brad's running our meeting. Brad is stepping in in a lot of areas with other members of our team and we're really appreciative because uh, it is a loss. Uh, I plan to post the public information officer position in the very near future. We have updated this job description and also adjusted our exempt salary procedure scale in an attempt to find a highly qualified person to fill this need, which would also allow us to discontinue our current contracted services with Allerton Hill. By combining a portion of the funds we have used on our public information officers exempted salary and contracted services with Allerton Hill, we see savings in the communications department. And Dr. Fine, just really quickly refresh my memory on the, um, are we bound by like a 30, 60, 90 day notice with Allerton? Him? Yeah, if you recall earlier, I think it was September and Kyle will be able to speak specifically to this. We asked that question uh, and they said they wanna work with us. Uh, if we stay in communication, I think it went to a 30 day, uh, 30 day, notification. We've been in communication. They they are aware of our plan and, and what we're doing. And the hope is to communicate with them as soon as we find uh, who we're looking for. Yeah, I'm really thankful for that. They've been a great partner yeah. to help us in those gap areas where we needed some additional um, communication and, and flushing things out. So, um, but that's good that we were able, I couldn't remember what the yeah. window was. We, but... we tweaked it earlier this fall with, with that being our plan. I think that 30 days is correct. That's also my recollection. And I do want to say that, um, you know, in particular, Tyler was really an important partner for us during the pandemic, during the toughest times when we were preparing so many communications to go out to our community to explain what was coming next. And I know he worked really hard and, you Long know, hours. was 
long hours and was was there and and um, he and I and the superintendent at that time spent you know hours working on a Q you know a, a a FAQ and answering questions that were coming in. And so um, I really appreciate all that. It was a tough time to be in communications yeah. in a school district. And it's a, it can be a lonely place. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're really not noticed until it's not going well. <laughs> and so it's a really, it, it can be a lonely place, but uh, he always was willing to dig in and support. And he gave us some really um, true gems. Uh, in terms of uh, product output, whether it be short videos, um, you know, interview coverage, whatever. Um, it was something that was new to Bexley. We yeah. didn't, you know, we operated solely print. Right. Um, and he really took us to a new level in, in terms of digital communication, um, increasing our, our, um, our, what do you call them? So I'm aging myself here, but on social media, posts. <laughs> not posts, <laughs> but uh, views. Yeah, <laughs> views. Yeah. Um, he increased views and, and, and engagement. That's the word I was there looking for. Um, engagement uh, with our community and, and people that support us, whether they have children in schools or not, they were now able to hear and see yeah. a lot of the work and the exciting things that happen all the time in the district. Um, he took it to a next level. So um, whoever's getting him is really getting yeah. um, a keen eye for that that uh, skill set. And he he helped me look really good in pictures. <laughs> well, I love that too. you mentioned his skill set. So you will see in tomorrow's newsletter and in your board report, uh, and we'll post for some engagement on social media sites, his swan song. He's worked with our amazing uh, early literacy folks and created a video to, to showcase some of the work that we do, which is really going to be helpful for our families and, and our community members. But it's a it's a perfect way for uh, as he exits yeah. to leave that, That's that, awesome. that uh, lasting impression. Awesome. Marguerite. Um, when when you reached out to similarly situated school districts with communication structures that you think are successful, what did you learn about costs and structures, right? Like yeah. you're sort of reorganizing, right? You're taking two bodies of money and putting them into one body mm -hmm. in, a, in a hope both that get a really high quality single person and also save some money. Yep. So what do you so I'll be, What I've learned is most, I think of the five or six, seven local districts that I talk to, everyone but one still, no matter what system they have, they have Allerton Hill or another uh, mm -hmm. firm. Uh, the one who does not had a different firm. It wasn't Allerton Hill, but had a different firm. And they've since uh, moved away from that and brought in someone, uh, someone down the road with a very similar uh, makeup as us. Uh, we're at 2,400 students. I think they're at 3,400. They have uh, a public information officer that's making closer to 100,000 uh, and then a uh, $15,000 contract with Allerton Hill. Some of those bigger districts in the belt are two. They have a, a chief and a, and a public information officer, an assistant. Um, so that's, as you get into the more like us, it's one person with some support on the side from Allerton Hill for that moment of crisis. Sometimes they use them for their social media, uh, helps monitor to protect support. Uh, but those are the things I'm seeing. I, I was surprised to see the majority of them uh, still have a, a smaller contract with Allerton Hill or, or a, a firm. So you saw a shift in much the same way that you're shifting. More, Correct. Sort of more increase in salary mm -hmm. and a smaller contract. And a small contract with, with them for the, for the moment of uh, unforeseen issues. So before you move on from um, shift from the position from, um, uh, I'm, I just want to offer, and I don't know if because this opportunity will come up, that you and we talked about this a little bit on Monday, take the time to offer a runway for right. yourself in the district yeah. before filling the principal position and really rethinking potentially what the principal description is, like the job descriptions, revisiting that, that are there in alignment with the policies, taking some time to do this process well in alignment with your sort of vision of what the district can be. So that's Noted. Not Thank you. Can I ask you a quick question yeah. on the, so is that those small $15,000 contracts with Allerton Hill, is that like a crisis thing or do you know? Yeah, they, 
in the quick conversations, it, it was around crisis. It was around small projects that they look for. Um, could be some of those communications that they do quarterly, those okay. sorts of things. Yep. Um, and then also the social media impact. Thank you. On the principal, you are going to, oh, I'm sorry, Victoria, are you done? Do you have another question? Okay. Um, you are gonna, in your email communication, explain the process for community engagement and engagement of staff to go through the process to identify the next principal for Maryland. Correct. And is it your hope that that's filled by the time we start school in the fall? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. We, we, we're going to move very quickly. We have... We well, have, finding the most... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Canada but citizens. moving quickly yes. means posting a position, yeah. okay. communicating appropriately, and, and informing stakeholders. Okay, thank yeah. you. So just to clarify, your expectation is to post that position and fill it with somebody from the outside? My expectation is to post the position, go through the process, and determine who is the best person for that role. So I think, as I listen to my fellow board members, <clears throat> moving quickly while also having a lengthy runway. I'm not into the moving quickly part. Um, so let me say that I am in, interested in having an incredibly qualified person and giving the community time to make sure that that happens. Well, and if that means having an interim, then that would be all right as well. I don't think I understood that that's what you were asking for. So that makes sense now, um, because I do think we have um, we have uh, date constraints around hiring and contracts and for administrators like we do with teachers, right? Like windows that they can accept positions or not. There are windows that you get into that uh, may not be let out of their contract. Okay. And so it, your inclination is post an interim for however long it takes or? You could probably have an interim for a year, giving the community time to find somebody. It's well, late it's in the, the process. It's the community's job to find the Or principal. the community, the school district, whoever. But they, they have enough community input, right? So that the process isn't rushed. It is possible within our district to fill that position with an interim. So typically, in interim, interims, for, in my experience, typically come when you are in the middle of a process, in the middle of a school year where you're trying to accomplish a task. April is a wonderful opportunity for us to find some really qualified people. If we go through a process and we don't find the person that we think is stellar, like a Susan Drake, we don't settle. We wouldn't settle. That's then when I would start considering, is there an interim that we need to put in place to make sure that what we have for our students and our community is effective? April is, it, when I say move fast, I mean on some amazing candidates. I wanna make sure that they know that we have an, uh, an opening. We've been talking to some incredible people. Let's get them into the game. Then you go through a very detailed uh, and methodical process. Why we, what I mean by move fast is let people know who are already applying for other positions in other districts. We in Bexley have an opening and we want you, if you are highly qualified to get into the game. Mm -hmm. So I think just because uh, Dr. Jade and I have, and Jonathan, uh, Dr. Baker, sorry, and I have all engaged uh, from a community standpoint, board uh, standpoint, uh, but definitely as community members engaged in um, the processes of, uh, in the last few years of um, hiring, and you, you as well, you were on the committee for um, Ms. Drake as well? No, my kids weren't in school yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know. Um, but, you know, we've all engaged in the process and, and there have been, we've all probably given our, our extensive feedback over the years of um, kind of how those processes can be improved. I think having um, MKL help us guide that process, Mr. Smith helping, helping with that process too, maybe it'll help sort of um, improve it because, yeah. and I, I don't want to speak for you, Dr. Day, in any way, shape, or form, um, but I know, having had my own experience with it, that there were quite a few choppy bumps along the road, mm -hmm. and um, so, you know, I can understand, you know, sure. why, you know, that. We're not, we don't want to rush. Right. Yep. So, I, I get, I get that. <clears throat> yeah. I didn't want to speak for you. I just, I was talking through my own experience. 
Anything else before the next one? All right. Any other questions? Experiential learning. We're going to bring our friend Steve Shapiro up to the podium. Uh, this evening, our leader of student and community engagement will share an overview of the experiences he has facilitated for our students this 21-22 uh, school year. We began the year by identifying the importance of connecting students to experiences of interest through our commitment plan. And we are so grateful for Mr. Shapiro's leadership, his energy, his passion, uh, and his wisdom as you have worked with our students and our staff. So uh, Steve, take it away. Thank you, Jason. Uh, good evening, members of the Board of Education. I begin by thanking you for your service to our community. I know it's often a thankless job, but it's a super important job, so thank you for your work you do. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit of uh, my work with you tonight, and I, I guess I want to break it into three parts. One is I want to give you a sense of why do we have a leader of experiential learning? I know this position, even though it's a relatively new position, came from a different board and a different superintendent. So a brief history, I want to share with you some of the work that I've been doing with students so you can see, uh, you know, a close look at like what some of this work looks like. And then I want to take a little look to the future and see what's possible moving forward. So <clears throat> to begin with, I think the idea of a leader of experiential learning and thinking about experiential learning really rests on the fact that I think that our previous superintendent and board were recognizing that the foundation of our modern school system, that, that is the whole way we approach education and the systems and structures that we work on, were built in a different era. They were built in an era predominantly in the late 1800s and early 1900s in response to the technological innovations of that time, which were industrialization and mass production. And so we built a school system that was really suited to prepare kids for the kind of work that they were gonna be doing in that industrial world, which required things like retaining content, performing low level procedures, following instructions. And, and we built a very powerful economy uh, using a school system that prepared students for those specific types of, uh, of that particular type of economy. And I think that the school board recognized, and I think it's impossible to not recognize that we're living through, obviously since 1800s and the early 1900s, we've encountered an incredible amount of change technologically and socially, but probably even in the last generation, in the last 30 years, we've probably witnessed greater changes in technology and in social processes, probably than any generation in the history of the human race. So here we are confronting uh, a whole new set of needs for our students. What we see consistently, and the, the, the world of work consistently tells us that what they're looking for from our students as they in, in approach the world of work is 21st century skills. And this has been out there for a long time, and I'm sure you're quite familiar with this consistent reporting on this. Advanced communication skills, critical thinking, critical problem solving, collaboration, the ability to work well within a team, creativity, innovation, the ability to develop new solutions to complex problems. So these are the kind of things that our students need to be successful in the world. Uh, we also see that there's a series in addition to these skills of dispositions that are consistently reported. And this is by not just business and industry, but also by universities and colleges and higher education. Things like intellectual curiosity, things like self-directedness, resilience, adaptability, passion. This is, this is the set of skills and dispositions that our students are really called upon for their success in the future. And almost all of those dispositions and skills are developed through experience. Those are done through actual hands-on participation and experiential learning. So the position was created, I think, in response to the needs that our students have for success in the future. Um, I want to share with you a little bit about what that's looked like in my position. And I also want to add in the expansion of community engagement, which happened when Laysan Smith left the district last year, and I picked up some of her responsibility for engaging our community. So I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the new programs, special learning opportunities, career exploration, classroom implementations related to experiential learning. But then I'll also share with you a little bit about briefly community engagement, partnerships, learning opportunities, and equity initiatives. So. I wanna take you through some of the programs that I've had a chance to work with and develop in my time, two and, a, two and three quarters years in Bexley schools. One is the Global Scholars Program, which is a partnership with the Columbus Council on World Affairs. I work with Jennifer Cedeno, a Spanish teacher at the high school. Uh, we have about 50 students, ninth and 10th graders who are participating in this program. This program is really specialized in focusing on uh, global cultures, global issues, and global careers. So we're giving our students a chance to get connected with uh, global awareness and preparation for their future. 
I've also had a chance to work uh, and help develop with the Bexley Minority Parent Alliance, the Buddies Program. I've worked with Lisa Kelly from BMPA. This is a mentorship program where some of our high school students of color have been able to take on the role of mentoring some of our elementary and middle school students of color. Uh, this program has been really powerful, not just for the little buddies who have had a role model who looks like them and who they can look up to, but it's also been really powerful for the big buddies who have had an opportunity to step into a role of leadership and develop themselves as someone who can make a difference in the world. You can get a look at uh, some of the students. We have about 17 pairings this year. This was last year's group. Also, we formed a new program in partnership with the uh, Bexley Chamber of Commerce this year. And I'm working with Nancy Mallory at the high school on an initiative called Bexley Women Lead. We've got 15 ninth and 10th grade students who are basically learning about leadership and developing their own leadership in, in conjunction with some women leaders from our community that the Chamber of Commerce has identified. So these students are basically getting a chance to develop their own leadership and learn about the path that other women have, have followed in, uh, in becoming leaders in our community. One of the Really exciting initiatives that I've had a chance to work on is the Student Leadership Research Collaborative. And this is a program that Keith Bell at Ohio State University, Dr. Keith Bell has developed. This program basically asks students from about 20 different schools around central Ohio to identify a problem in their school, research it and develop a solution to it. And last year we had a group of students involved. This year we have another group of students involved. They're getting incredible leadership development. Keith Bell brings the A-list of leadership speakers. I think tomorrow they're meeting with um, the woman who wrote Freedom Writer as the movie was based on. Uh, here they were meeting with Warren Moon. Really amazing leadership development. But the heart of the program is students actually doing independent action research on issues that they care about in their school, figuring out what's really happening and then proposing solutions to try to make a difference. And so uh, these students, the students this year in the program, there, there are nine students. The three students in the front row are working on uh, expanding representation and belonging for students of color. The students in the middle row are working on achievement culture, pressure, and stress for both students and staff. The students in the back row, including our new student council president, James McCann, are working on trying to expand opportunities for more student-directed learning in our high school. So my hope is that you'll have a chance to hear about their research and hear their proposals uh, as members of this board as they roll those out in the next month. Also, as the leader of experiential learning, I've had a chance to get students out into the community where they've had a chance to see uh, and interact with adults in a variety of formats. Um, these are just some brief pictures from around. I won't go into the details of specifics, although I share them in board reports, so you, you may recognize some of the opportunities that our kids have had. Um, but, but these have been really op outstanding opportunities for our students to get outside of school and experience learning in the community. I'm really proud to be working on expanding the number of exchange students that we serve in our school from outside. Every student, exchange student that comes in brings a global culture with them and gives our students a chance to expand their worldview. I'm really proud of these three Bexley kids. I think probably the most we've ever had, we have three Bexley students who are going out next year for a full year to be exchange students. So I'm really proud of these three. They're all gonna be working through Rotary and spending a year overseas uh, as students next year. Career shadowing has been a big part of the work. Uh, this you can see is a shot from Bexley Connect, and Bexley Connect is the database of community members who have offered to become uh, role models and to share their professional and personal expertise with our students. We have over 500 community members in Bexley Connect, and they have served uh, as, as mentors and hosts for career shadowing experiences. We had one in October and one in March. Uh, serving about 300 of our students. Our students got out into the community, learned about careers, uh, were mentored by some of, our, uh, some of our community members. And it was really some really powerful experiences for kids. But I thought what was really great about the career shadowing that we've been expanding for our students is that not only have the kids found it powerful and eye-opening and enlightening and opening paths for their future, but our community members have been really lit up by the chance to work with our kids. If you, if you run into Chad Eddy sometime, ask him about his time with our kids. Uh, it's, it's been exhilarating for our adults to be able to share their expertise with our kids. Even the governor got involved in March hosting a group of our students at the state house. We also added the senior takeover this year where we invited some of our seniors to take the, take the reins and teach. And we had some really awesome sessions led by students on the day of the ACT, where our seniors were basically teaching a lot of our freshmen and sophomores some really cool stuff. So we're trying to give more opportunities for students to lead. In terms of community engagement, um, I'll be pretty brief on that. We've had a chance to develop a lot of partnerships, and these are some of the organizations, some of them within Bexley, some of them in the Central Ohio community, but 
part of my job is always looking for opportunities to connect with who's out there and find opportunities for our students to work in authentic ways with organizations in our community. And that's those partnerships for me are really important and joyful. And I think uh, as, as with Quinn being a part of this body, I think when our students are part of adult worlds and working in authentic ways, that's when they really have a chance to blossom into their full potential. We've expanded community engagement beyond, we had done a lot of like, we're sharing stuff with you. One of the things when I took over Laysan's portion of that job was I wanted to expand, not just us sharing with our community, but us talking together with our community. And so we created, hey, Bexley, let's talk. And we've had a series of conversations where our community has come together to discuss uh, important issues using podcasts and, and articles as, as foundational discussion points. We've talked about equity. We've talked about achievement culture. We've talked about college rankings. We also hosted a session on the dangers of fentanyl to uh, help our parents be more aware of how they can help keep their kids safe in the face of this public health crisis. So if you kind of look at the what I've shared, you've seen that I've talked about new programs, I've shared special learning opportunities and career exploration, community partnerships, learning opportunities. I hope you've seen the equity initiatives, although I think that could be a whole other presentation. But what you haven't seen as much of, and I think one of the areas uh, that lies before us is the idea of classroom implementation. So. Most of the work that I've been able to do has been on the side. It's been taking kids out for a special program, taking kids out for a special day. But I think the area that I have had probably less success than I would like to have had so far is on actually transforming the daily learning experiences of kids so that experiential learning is at the heart and the core of what they do. And while I'm not here to make any excuses, COVID has not been super helpful in creating space for authentic learning experiences in our classroom as teachers have scurried heroically to respond to distance learning and you know, Zoom and a, a thousand things. But I think the opportunity that lies before us, I think when COVID hit, um, for those of you, you, know, you pay attention, you know in business, they're always that looking for disruption. It takes a disruption to lead to change. COVID has been the disruption to the education system. We, we probably will never experience a greater disruption to business as usual as COVID produced for us. And I think the first reaction to a disruption is we need familiarity and we cling back to what is comfortable and what's, what's recognizable. But I think what's been interesting, and I, you've probably heard this this year, and I've heard it from a lot of students and teachers, and you see it in a lot of research, is people saying this year has been even harder than last year. This year has been even more difficult. And I think it's because we're clinging back to the old system and it's, it's overwhelming as, it, as, it, as we face it. I think the opportunity before us today is to say, okay, the year is gonna end, we have a chance to step back. How do we reassess what's happening? How do we look back and say, what vestiges of the old system are still there that we're ready to let go of? What opportunities for new models of education are available that can prepare our kids for their future, um, not our past? Uh, one of the things we're doing, and I, I applaud Dr. Fine because I think he's really showed leadership on this, is um, I've been working with a team of folks to put together a major summer institute on authentic learning and leadership. This is going to be a, a, a two-day experience, but it's also going to have pre-conference and a lot of post-conference learning opportunities. Every principal in our district is going to attend this, this conference, this institute, with a team of teachers from their school. And I think it's our hope that this will be beginning of a conversation that we can engage our teachers and our principals in really examining what's possible. How do we engage our students with more authentic learning opportunities? How do we prepare them with those skills and those dispositions that they're gonna need for their success? So I'll leave it at that and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. I got a question, Steve. Thanks for the presentation, it was super helpful. It's always nice to see the kid. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so when you consider the achievement culture that's kind of fueled by grades and test scores, mm -hmm and the tracking structures that exist in Bexley starting super early on, how might they be disrupted by this sort of experiential learning model? Well, I mean, I think the, 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 the examples that you pointed out are part of a kind of a structure, an organizational structure that schools are based on. I always think about experiential learning. For example, let's use, an, let's use a simple example, service learning, kids doing a service project. It's hard to say, how'd you do on your service project? What'd you get on your service project? Uh, it, because what you got is something that's not easily quantifiable and measurable. And I think we have rooted ourselves deeply in quantifiable and measurable outcomes. And while I think there, those can be important, I think a lot of the most important things we learn and the experiential things we do are the hardest to quantify. So I think, you know, it, it challenges us to say, you know, if you do an internship, if five kids do an internship, how do you know who was the best internship? Was it the kid who is going to do that career? The kid who learned that they definitely don't want to do that career? Um, so I think 
the challenge is for us to say, can we create authentic spaces for kids to learn that sometimes fall outside of those traditional structures and ranking systems we have? Because that's where a lot of times that powerful personal growth learning is going to happen. Right. So, I mean, one of the things you're talking about is most of these are happening outside. And so what all of what you said, how might, if brought inside, might disrupt some of the challenges the kids have been facing with the yeah. achievement culture and also the inequities sure. that exist inherently yeah. in a tracking. No, I, I, I love the question because I think, I, I don't think I can give you an answer like what it will look like. But I think the question at the heart of the question is a really important point, which is that the creation of this kind of learning space is a response to and a potential antidote to the stress our kids are experiencing, as well as the inequities that are built into our system. And so I think, you know, and, and I think this, honestly, I think, Marguerite, what you're asking is a challenge that we face, which is to what degree are we as a school district prepared to let go of historical practices that have been hierarchical and structural in service of learning opportunities and experiences for our kids? And I, I can't answer that myself, except to say that, that that's a challenge we will confront. Okay. So anytime maybe, you make change. Right. So I guess along those same line, what are you noticing about the students who thrive in those experiential learning settings? Yeah, I think it's a good question because I don't think that a certain, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, these experiential learning opportunities are good for kids who can't do the regular school. Yeah. Absolutely. Clearly, those kids in the leadership collaborative who you'll hear from, they're some of our top students. And I think they'll tell you that their work in a leadership collaborative is powerful and profound in ways that traditional school isn't. Not that it's one or the other. I think it's both and. I think kids need some of those traditional learning experiences. But I think obviously kids who are not thriving in the traditional system can really benefit from a different kind of learning experience. But I think we make a great mistake if we say kids who are doing well or have high GPAs, oh, they don't need experiential learning. They're doing fine as is. Because there's no kid who doesn't benefit from an opportunity to do an internship. There's no kid who doesn't grow doing a major service project. There's no kid who doesn't learn being in charge of or developing leadership as part of a team. Developing collaboration skills. You know, every founder of a company, every CEO of a company has to have those skills. It's, it doesn't matter that you just have good grades. So it, I think it's for all kids. Right. So I guess my question is, if you notice kids who aren't thriving in the traditional setting, is that giving them an opportunity? Not that other kids shouldn't be. Not that it should be available to everybody. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we should be, I mean, from my standpoint, I think we should be expanding and providing more opportunities within the curriculum for kids to make those choices. And I think, you know, right now, most kids in the curriculum have a choice, you know, kind of an honors class or a regular class, an AP class or a regular class. But I think we could look at how do we, how do we rethink the way we approach offering opportunities to students that doesn't require that necessary, that same binary choice. That's, that isn't necessarily the only choice that we could provide kids. Well, I will say, um, Mr. Shapiro, I conducted uh, over the last several weeks, multiple interviews um, for to fill positions across um, our, our growing division. And um, almost all of the folks that grabbed my attention um, were able to clearly communicate, talked about that level of collaboration, spent time talking about their passion and how their experience um, working in that whatever division and, and you know, uh, real estate, corporate commercial real estate can get real dry really fast. Um, but for someone to talk about why something is really exciting to them in that field and, and articulate that, um, those were the folks that I moved on to the next um, level to um, engage with our executive leadership um, because our organization very deeply values those sorts of um, things in it. So reimagining education has been something that I've always been a huge proponent of. Um, so it, I, I will be closely watching in, in all ears to- uh, Thanks, hear I, I appreciate that comment. And I think as part of my work, I'm spending a lot of time talking to folks in higher education and talking to folks in the world of work consistently Always, I've talked with three different uh, folks who do hiring in major mm -hmm. international corporations. Consistently, they want to see what have you done. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, maybe grades will get you in the door, but in the end, what have you done? What's your story? I have no interest in grades. Yeah, I'm talking to someone. Yeah. Um, so, I really yeah. want to know what they've done, what that experience yeah. will bring to the table. Yeah, I think increasingly employers are looking, and colleges are looking for evidence of those skills and evidence of those dispositions that I pointed out yeah. earlier. And so, you know, the, the traditional here's my transcript 
especially in a, in a competitive college, you know, we're accepting one out of 10 applicants. They all have high grades and took, mm. but what have you done? Mm -hmm. And it's that special project. And that's what makes you stand out. So I always tell kids, don't do this because it looks good on a college application, but it will, it will. do it yeah. because you'll develop your potential. Right. And I, I think, you know, Alicia it really asks, begs the question kind of what is our job? What are we doing? And if our, if we see our job as mining human potential, as developing the human resources that each of our kids have, we have to look for opportunities to develop those through experiences. And I think that's that's the challenge we face. And by the way, every district face, faces it. And since this board had the leadership to create this position, other districts in the area have started to create similar kinds of positions based on the same recognition. I'll go real quick. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. I'm, I'm smiling on the inside as I think about the work you've done and the work you're gonna to continue to do and think about for me uh, as an educator and and how there's so many different things we want to do with problem-based learning, project-based learning, and we have the curriculum to cover, but yet we also want to get to different levels with like Bloom's taxonomy with creating and analyzing and going deeper and designing, right? And so you're doing the, you're kind of doing all of this, to, you know, it makes me want to smile as a math guy, you know, like, hey, we want to kind of just not just learn about Pythagorean theorem, but how does it apply and, and different things like that. And even talking with some some faculty today at Ohio State, you know, it's like we're looking at how to reimagine our summer offerings and how to be more interdisciplinary, right? And 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 so your work is kind of leaning that way. And, and even thinking about how now with college applications, they're getting away from the, you know, uh, high achievement tests and just kind of more of a, a test optional, if you will, right? So then and thinking about these experiences could help the students with their applications, but it helps them find themselves, helps them find their passions, right? And so I think you're kind of helping them in different kinds of ways. I think to, to Marguerite's point, you know, one thing that could help is also uh, maybe some kind of, well, talk to me about what kind of assessment you have of the student experience. So not so much a, a, a Likert scale of did you like this, yes or no, but what kind of reflection, what kind of um, uh, ways our students thinking about their experience with, with you. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's funny. Like I, I love the question about assessment because I think assessment drives all that we do. I mean, the way we assess and the way we evaluate um, learning drives all that we do. I often think about if someone says, are you a good parent? And each of us could answer that question. But there's no metric to say, are you a good parent? I mean, you could say, well, whoever goes to the most soccer games is the best parent, but we know that that's right. not the metric. The metric of being a good parent is much more complex than that. To understand our success as parent requires a much deeper level of reflection, a much more honest and personal take on that. And so I think this is part of the challenge of experiential learning is it, it belies the simple assessment of like, give me a number and tell me how good it is. It's more complex because the rich things in life always are more complex. And so what we do see in, as students go out and do these experiences, we've been collecting a lot of research from them. And some of the students in the leadership collaborative have been collecting research. And what we find is kids are lit up, kids are excited, kids are happy, they're joyful. Kids are seeing relevance in the work that they're doing and recognizing it as contributing to their future. And I think that, you know, we, the fact that we are experiencing kind of a mental health crisis for young people and for teachers, frankly, in our country right now is no secret. Um, it's, the Surgeon General has put that forward. It's, it's evident in all the research. So I think one of the greatest indicators of what's possible in experiential learning is the joy. I mean, the, the theme of this conference is making learning irresistible, getting back to the joy of teaching and learning, both for our teachers and our students, because in the end, the joyful learning is where a lot of the most important growth happens. And I think a lot of that's been squeezed out in a number of ways. And the last thing I wanna to say too is, thank you, thank you, thank you for going to all the teachers, going to all the students and really trying to sell and talk about what you're gonna do. Cause I'm sure there's plenty of emails, there's plenty of correspondence back and forth, there's plenty of starts and stops. And just to see the, the pictures of the students with the mask on and trying to work through logistics that some corporation and how they handle masking and compared to our students. And, and so thank you for all the minutia that you had to go through to get a, a great product. I just want to clear my, my question was not to try to, how do you take, how do you assess with a number system, what you're doing? My question was actually the opposite. Yeah. How do you take what you're doing and disrupt the achievement culture that we yeah. have? No, so, I totally get it. All right.
totally get it. <laughs> and Steve, you know, this is just a snapshot of your program, right? This is just 10 minutes of what yeah. you do. Um, could you talk a little bit, and some of your programming lends more to interaction between yourself and students at the high school level. Mm -hmm. Now that we are back in school, I mean, one of the things that I'm interested in too is seeing how is some of your programming trickle down to middle school students too now? Um, what opportunities do you see in the future um, for that age group? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. You know, the the I think that the middle school model, the design of middle school model is more experiential by nature. So, you know, in a, in a middle school space, experiential learning is probably already happening more than a, in a traditional high school model. Um, I think there are challenges there, quite honestly, because a lot of our middle school becomes aligned with our high school because we have kids who are advancing courses and kids who are, you know, we're, we've kind of created the high school sometimes drives the middle school and can drive out the middle school design or the focus of what a middle school philosophy is. Mm -hmm. That's another challenge. Um, but I do think that we have some good examples in the middle school of experiential learning that are happening. And I do think that it's a place where we have a lot more opportunity. Obviously, elementary school, you, you know, you can't sit a group of elementary kids down and lecture them for too long. You, you figure out that doesn't work. Kids have to be minutes. engaged. As kids get older, we, we get more into that. So I think I think part of it is creating space, you know, in our flex periods, for example, a lot of opportunity in, uh, in, in some of our middle school model spaces. But I, I think that that's, it's a fair question. I don't know that I have a simple answer. I mean, that's, that's fine. I think I would, I would like you to explore that a little bit more now that uh, kids are in school full time now. It just may give middle schoolers a, another avenue. Yeah. Um, you know, if they're not in an extracurricular after school, maybe this is something they would enjoy doing too. So, right. and am I recalling wrong? I think you, when, and maybe your first year of the experiential learning, you did focus a lot on the middle school. We did do a lot of middle school um, stuff. Yeah. Because the high school model was so entrenched um, and had some real successes there. Um, and I'm just excited actually to see that the high school has grown by leaps and bounds in terms yeah. of participation. Yeah, and, and I think Jason Cottle is a huge proponent of this kind of learning. We've been working, I, I mean, this year we've been working on kind of building some major experiential learning opportunities at the sixth grade level, at the seventh grade level, at the eighth grade level. You know, our sixth graders are gonna be out at Camp Mary Orton doing uh, team building and personal development, collaboration, kind of that moving in. Um, and so we're, we're building some of that, but I think there are many opportunities to continue forward, yeah. And I think there's a very, I think the middle school staff and the middle school leadership are very on board with, mm -hmm. with the process. Yeah. yeah, just, yeah, go ahead. Are you done? I just want to add my thanks. I know this has been a, a great amount of work. It's achieving great results. Not only is there joy in these students, but there's confidence. There's a new learning of um, complex knowledge that can't be learned in other ways. And um, you know, or this at least supports that in a, in a really important way. I'm so grateful that you took this on for our district. Your background has been really important. Um, I've been able to participate in all the things that you've offered out to the community, and, and I'm really grateful for that. Um, and I think this is really important, not just for um, some students, but for all students. Um, all students, I totally agree with you that all students benefit from these opportunities to learn differently, to, to grow the way you're presenting. And I, and I love the way you're talking about what comes next too. So I'm very excited for that and um, have a lot of gratitude. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Victoria. And I think, you know, we do know, like I see statistics, like 51% of our kids participate in extracurriculars. And my thought always is 49% of our kids don't. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we have to make sure that every kid is getting, and some of our kids we know in this community have amazing summer opportunities and have incredible social networks through their parents. Some of our kids don't. And so I think from an equity lens, trying to build up options for every kid to gain that confidence and that, that joy is really important. All right. Thank you all very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Quinn? Yeah. All right. Um, so I just have a few comments about this. The first thing I want to say is I really want to express how grateful I am. And I know the entire student body is really grateful for all the new learning opportunities that we've had in the past few years. Like I've no, noticed a significant increase in the like, cool learning opportunities that I've had and all of my peers have had. And I also think like we were talking about uh, high stress culture and 
uh, academic achievement culture. I think opportunities like this and integrating them into our learning is a really good way to help combat the stress of like traditional classes. And I think it's a great way to have a break from the more traditional classes while also having great learning opportunities and just great life opportunities and like life experiences that like, I mean, just myself, uh, I've had some really cool opportunities that have definitely made me realize like what I want to do in college or after college. And I think that's the same for a lot of my peers. Thanks for saying that, Quinn. I, I, I'm sure you all read the article about the women in STEM group at the school and Madison Ingram was talking about, you know, building hot air balloons and trying to figure out how to make them work and like designing this project. And it was just experiential learning happening that kids were running and designing themselves. And there was clear joy and enthusiasm and excitement for it. And, and so I appreciate you saying that, Quinn. I know having spent 30 years doing this kind of work with kids, I know how fun and exciting and meaningful experiential learning opportunities are for kids. And so that's why I have the passion that I do for it. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate uh, your time, your commitment. It is interesting how many districts call us to get access to Steve because they're thinking of a, a concept or a, an avenue to, to do some things that are similar. So thank you, well done. And that's it for my section. Great, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. So next we move into the um, items underneath superintendent's comments and we've got a you know, pretty long list of things to approve. I'm hopeful that we don't need to talk about each and every one of these, but I do want the board to say um, which of these we should pull out for discussion. Um, what items do folks want to discuss? So what I'd like to do as we've done in the past is identify what we need to discuss and with respect to the ones that we can just um, vote on as a consent portion of section four, Let's do that. So are there items for B through 4O, or I'm sorry, through 4N that people want to talk about? I'd like to talk about the gifted policy. So in 4.1 and the gifted handbook for J. So that's for um, the policies are for I and oh, for I. Yep, <laughs> and the handbooks are for J. Yep. Um, and we've got other handbooks on there, the elementary, middle, and, and high school handbooks. Do you have questions about that? Anybody else? Um, okay. Does anybody else have are, you know, I'm sure those are other people also want to talk about some of those. Are there any others in 4B through 4N that folks want to pull out and talk about? If not, I would like to um, ask for a motion to approve items 4B, 4C, D, E, F, G, K, L, M, and N. You also need H, right? Yeah. Did I? Yeah. Uh, um, probably M as H. well. M, what? but but not N. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm so kind of we're going to vote on all of those except I, <laughs> J, and M and N. M. I would do M and N together. So N. So. Okay. M and N. M, M and N. N. So I would I would look for a motion to approve B C D E F G H K L and that's it. So moved. Thank second. you. Second. Second. All in favor of approval of those items, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. So let's go to I. Uh, can I ask a process question? Yes. Are we going to discuss each of the four and then vote them as one grouping? Or are we going to discuss one at a time and vote them individually? Let's discuss them one at a time and vote them each individually. Unless, I mean, that would be what I would. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to know what I'm yeah. doing. Well, for me, I'm going to, the only one in the under I that I really want to talk about is the IGBB policy. So 
I don't, I, does that make sense? Let's start with the resolution just because it's the first one. Um, we have a resolution before us that um, uh, would permit us to meet remotely as a group if there's a reason to do that or um, have a, any board member who cannot be at a meeting to um, participate remotely. The change from our policies is that that board member would be able to vote. Um, as, our, as our policies currently stand, you don't have to be here. You can, you can participate remotely, but you can't vote. You don't count for a quorum. And there's a couple other things I think that apply. All of that would be lifted through June 30th. So um, that's what this resolution would do. It would lift um, the in-person requirement for our school board meetings and for our voting. Um, any discussion of that resolution? Kyle, I know you'll stop me if I'm doing something goofy. Um, Send up flares. <laughs> I see him <laughs> worrying over there. Um, all in favor of, uh, I, I feel like we should treat this resolution differently. Is that? My, my belief is just like you did with the whole section four talk, are there, is there just one policy that needs to be discussed? Um, I'm taking this one separately because it's not a first read. That's the only reason. Okay. Is that, does that make sense to you? Yeah. Let's vote on this one then. I'll call the question on the resolution if there's no discussion on it. All in favor of adopting the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion carries, thank you. The rest of these, let's um, just identify the ones that people have questions about or wanna talk about and then we can take them all as one. Um, okay, that's fine. We can, okay. IGGB. I'm sorry, I'm pulling up the wrong. You, one. you mean IG double B? IGBB, yeah. A lot of B's going on. So, what I know about this policy is that it is intended to. Um, so, we, we spent a fair amount of time talking about this policy in our meeting. We talked about it in two meetings, in fact, um, as a kind of a broad brush, it is intended to incorporate into our board policy, the work that was already adopted um, in terms of, you know, following the, the committee, the task force that looked at um, gifted learning offerings. Um, and so this, uh, this change to the policy would put those items into our board policy around what is, um, offered or can be offered. As you guys probably know, we are required to identify students who are gifted and that's all set out in law. We are not required to provide these services, but we are required to have a plan for what the services will be. And that's what is new in here is adjustment to the plan that we are required to have. Um, to reflect those changes that we made, um, you know, a couple months ago, maybe. Um, the other changes here were um, an attempt at uh, looking through a, an equity lens. There was some clarification. We actually tried to make some changes that we ended up not making because when we previewed those with the Ohio Department of Education, who reviews our plan annually, and approves it or does not. They um, told us that it might not be good to change in our plan the language that came out of their, um, out of Ohio law. So the changes that were, we started with were changes to adopt the um, changes to our plan that would provide different kinds of learning. Uh, at different age levels. The other changes, some of them we stuck with and some of them we did not stick with because of the input we got back from the Ohio Department of Education. So they said that our changes didn't align with the state law or with what their expectations are, the language. Yeah, it's, it's more that. And, and honestly, we had a 
was it not aligned with law? And no, it was, reason? you know, so it was, it was language that we wanted to change. And I can, I can tell you what it, what it was, um, that we thought was more inclusive and it was proposed to us by our director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. You know, he was with us and we were working on this and we liked the language. The Ohio Department of Education didn't like it. The first question that we talked about was, is do we legally have to have exactly their language? And, mm. and the answer to that is no. Mm. Um, so, you know, this is a first read. We can still consider adjusting this language a little bit. I think the group, you know, had a hard time deciding how to come out on that. And I'm not sure that we concluded that, you know, my personal view of it is that um, I'd rather change the language and I don't think we have to not change it, but I'm not dealing with the Ohio Department of Education every day. So I guess my question is if, if it's consistent with law and not violating law somehow, and it um, is aligned with our values and uh, what we have said as a district, we um, value and want to capture and we're not violating law. I don't I, like, I don't really understand why. I mean, we can take their, their recommendations as duly noted, right? But that that's open to their interpretation of whether or not they approve our plan just because they don't like the language. I mean, there's a lot of stuff they, right. Yeah. But, but their approval is based on law, right? Like they have to make sure that the plan we submit to them is compliant with law. I, I yeah. just making sure I understand. Right. And, and I will say that these changes are, um, they would make me and I think other people feel better. Mm. I don't think it's, um, you know, I, I think, I think the ODE should be willing to accept this language. Mm. Um, it's not a whole rewrite of the, of the document. It's a small, small things small change. Mm. So I, I just, just want to, that's a little heavy handed on their part. <laughs> it's easier for them. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's just sort of a background um, on what we did and what we were trying to do. So uh, other. So are we talking about the RGBD now? Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to start to say, sort of over your mind, because I usually try to send all my comments in my email ahead of time. When I read the policies, I read the board agenda so that I don't catch anybody. Um, you know, the 79 page handbook in the policies, I read, I looked at the number of things I wanted to write about. I did not have the time. Hey, your microphone's not on. Thanks. To pull together in this time. So there's going to be things that I'm going to share now that to some degree I've maybe shared with Jason when we talked Monday, but I didn't get a chance to send an email. And so that's not normally the way I would like to, because I think people I need time to that. sort of prepare. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to put that out there. And when we're just talking about the gifted policy on page three, there's sort of a, and I know this is a conversation and it might be what you're referring to, that idea of difference between being identified and classified, right? Like an identity is who somebody is. Right. And I find that problematic that we are identifying like you are gifted. That's who you are. Right. As opposed to there's been some assessments and you're classified in this gifted category. And that means X and Y and Z when we think about how we're going to provide education. That's language I'm not super comfortable with. I think the other one is on page four. There's a line that says student. Can, can you just I'm trying to take classified a note. versus can, identified. Just tell me on page three. Just, page three. We which, say, uh, hold on. Oh, that's gonna you're gonna stretch there's a bunch in. of places where we change the language to something like children who have been identified as gifted as opposed so to i i would as a, well, i would alternate classified for identified would be my yeah and there you know i'll i know to, yeah we can I you've agree. already said on page four at the very top students who are gifted yeah that, was, that is incredibly problematic to that, me. That I, a, I would say that all of our students, every single student in our school district is gifted. 
I think having that's that, one where we miss yeah, we, the change. We we've, we've tried to update we all of those. Everywhere. We that's just a miss. Yeah, we we if you it. go through the other parts of the document, we we agree with you, and I love that you've caught that. That's why I'm yeah. I'm thankful for the second reading. Our our attempt was to not have it read as you see right now. Okay, so thank you. So that change will be made for sure because yeah. that's the same change we've made in other places. They're just, we, we tried hard to catch them all, but we didn't catch them all. Um, and Victoria, I'm sorry. We, and again, we did have a very lengthy discussion with Mr. Braxton about this. And can we check if we were going to change the title as well? I just to noticed that. Change the title? Yep. Yeah, we got to make it there too. Yep. yep. Okay. Anything else? No. Okay. Um, so do you want to vote on this one separately? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're this just we're just doing a first, first read. read. Yeah. Yep. Too. So these changes get thrown in. Yep. And then no, we would have a second read, you know. I don't, I'm sorry, I didn't understand what you were saying. So you don't want, you want your changes put into it? Gotcha. I thought you were saying you did it. That's yeah, like, so wait, we're what? just accepting that this is a first read. Do we normally vote on first reads that they're, we just say we have done the first read. It doesn't mean we're adopting the policy. Correct. Okay, so all in favor of recognizing that we've done a first read of um, IGG, IGBB, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. That motion carries. What other board policies do folks want to pull out and talk about separately? Hearing none, is that right? Right. Um, I would entertain a motion for the rest of these uh, board policies that are up for first read tonight to acknowledge that we have done a first read of all of the rest of the policies that are here. So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, thank you, that motion carries. Um, hey, Victoria, when does the policy committee meet again? So if we had any further revisions um, for the second read, would it, we I think we we do, but we'll have this will be one of yep. we we've added we're trying to meet more regularly so that we can get the work oh, okay. done. So if we don't have time to get the, the changes because it's a lot tonight, mm -hmm. we will have time to to get. We want people to have an opportunity to provide uh, the feedback. feedback. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've got more policies that are coming next month. And one of the things that we've talked about in, in on this board before is understanding what's coming from the OSBA and what's coming just right. from internal. Um, and next month, we'll have second reads on these and we'll have first reads on some other policies. And a lot of that's just internal. Um, so um, so um, just for clarity, uh, when we get to second read point, um, any changes that have been caught recommended um, or feedback sent to policy committee, those changes get adopted into the second read. We will put them into the second read. Those we changes those will be to the meeting. So the, what you will see next time will, you know, it won't be programs for students who are gifted. It'll be programs who, for students who are classified or identified, whatever the word is that we end up with. That's what'll be in the mm -hmm. second read. We'll make those changes and we'll do a second read and adopt the policy or not. Okay, gotcha. Can I, I mean, you might've just asked this and I missed it, sorry. Did, so for at least these policies that the first read has just happened, can we get them before the Wednesday before? We, we'll get, well, well, we can commit to, you know, I- Because otherwise we're gonna be I reading these, the work, but you're gonna do some more, you know what so I mean? I'm talking for Carla yeah. here, but what, what we can do is we've got to get a meeting to we've got a meeting tomorrow we may be able to as soon as we have made adjustments to that policy we will send it out and we'll try to do them one at a time instead of doing yeah and we are cognizant of we it's a ton of work i don't think anybody would would understand how much work you're all putting in especially that week before 
and coming out. So we work really hard to try and get it. Carla does such an amazing job. There are things that slow us down, but we know the sooner we get it to you, the better for you all. Uh, we have failed in areas of that, and there have been moments where we, we have some success, but that's our, our commitment is to try and get it to you all as soon as possible. And this policy was one where we we thought we had it done, and then we reviewed and was like, okay, we didn't, right. we didn't get it right. So we had to go through it again. And, you know, it, it, there was a lot of time and effort to get this, you know, with all the little changes. So and the I reason that we're adopting we this particular policy for first read to move it through the process is because we have this role and these changes in the gifted program that we are looking to implement. The reason we, yes, the reason this policy came into, you know, this did not, nothing came from OSBA on right. this. This was one where because there had been that review of our gifted programs, right. we, wanted to make sure our policies aligned. aligned. I think I would just allow offer this feedback. Um, if when we're, the policy committee is um, smithing to the nth degree on a policy and it's still not correct, um, I'm okay with, I mean, we have quite a few policies for first read. I'm okay to have waited for that one right. to hit in May to get it right. Even if it's just a matter of here's, I mean, I, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying maybe pull it. Yeah, and I mean, move the, it or the, the the changes that didn't get made are are just the, the concept is in here right. for you to all see. I think it's actually important for us to have this opportunity to hear feedback sure. on it now. Um, because there is a timing issue to get these policies. So that's what I was trying to identify if there was a timing constraint in there. Um, and I agree, it's good to hear it in open session because we're not, we don't get an opportunity to um, hear the thinking yep. behind someone else's feedback unless we're here. Right. So, um, that, you know, that was just my thought process. I, well, and I on that, we actually did pull three or four policies that we were going to bring to you tonight for that for exact same reason. reason. We we decided this we're trying to get too many things done. We're never going to get this right. Mm -hmm. So that's those are the ones that we have on our agenda for tomorrow. Correct. Gotcha. But we'll we'll go back and work on these too. And certainly not a criticism. I sat on policy committee for two years, so I understand. Um, what you go through. So and thankful that you do the work that you do for it. So let's go next to um, item J, which is the K-12 gifted handbook. Comments or questions on that? Um, so it, it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition, I think, between Steve's um, conversation about experiential learning and the ways that our gifted um, program is structured. Um, and I, I looked through the gifted handbook and I did, I didn't read every, every single word, the document word for word, but I focused mostly on the areas where the changes were being made. And I reviewed it alongside the equity policy um, with the goal of educational equity in mind. And in particular, the part about establishing an environment where, where students feel they belong, right? And valued and supported. And sort of a belief I, you know, if you think about systems change and systems learning, and systems produce exactly what they're designed to produce. And right now our district is struggling to remedy long-standing opportunity gaps. And our data around gifted classification, special education classification, honors and AP course placements would indicate that these programs do not reflect our student body. Um, and while I see an effort towards equity, the flexible math groups, for instance, right? Mostly the handbook seems to just make adjustments around the edges, but did not engage in the deep critical deconstruction of systems required to investigate where inequities originate. If we want to do real equity work, then when we're looking at policies and handbooks, you got to look down deep where the hidden curriculums live, where the inequities start. And so this policy, because it's just playing around the edges, right? leaves an indication that our systems are currently working. And then we either have to believe that these disproportionalities that exist are the results of students 
So where specifically in the, in the handbook you? Oh, have... I'm not even going to get into the whole play by play. No, no, no. I just to... because we. Um, I'm just so I'm. I can. I'll get down there in a second. So if you want to look on page 34 okay. about preparing our students for the test, well, the handbook dissuades preparation. It does not address why students might feel why parents might feel preparation is necessary. You said 34. Page yeah, 34. Okay. Mm -hmm. A belief that their child will be seen differently or receive a different kind of education if they are somehow classified as gifted. This same fear is what causes third graders to cry when the test results come back and they're not classified as superior con. Because a nine-year-old knows, just like their parents, that without that classification, their education experience in Bexley will be different. So we are required by state law to test the state I'm just, I'm trying to address that point that you just made. The state requires the test. It tells us what um, tests we can use and it, it, it mandates this 95% piece. I mean, all of that is just coming from state law. Right, I, I understand that. Okay. What I am saying is that we have a culture in Bexley that says kids who are superior cog, kids who, who are classified as gifted are treated differently, have different opportunities are differently valued. And I can look at it just through they the do have different opportunities. I, I, right. I, yeah. <laughs> and if we look at the teachers that they have access to and the curriculum that they have access to and the expectations that they're held to around who they are and their intelligence, it's quite different. So even the six kids that I walked alongside, I got two superior cog, two were identified as gifted in certain content areas, one typical and one special ed. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you by far, the two who were identified as gifted had vastly different educational experiences back then were treated differently, right? Yeah. Left with a different sense of self than the other kids. We should not be creating and re reinforcing a system that values some kids better, differently than we value others. So I'm not saying we don't classify and we don't, the same way we classify kids as special ed and we respond to their needs. I'm not saying that. Nor am I saying that we should have kids do curriculum or do curriculum that they already have mastered. I'm not saying that either but we have a culture that values kids differently based on that classification. We surface it, we, we talk about it. We, if you have a nine-year-old who cries because they didn't get classified, they already know that getting pulled out for that gifted class means something differently. And, and this, all of this to me is incredibly frustrating, right? And what we do to kids who don't get that classification is even more frustrating, okay? So this is a document that says, these kids somehow are worth more than the rest of the kids in our district, right? And it reinforces that system that we have created, a culture we have created around achievement, a culture we've created around gifted identities, right? And what those kids deserve, as opposed to other kids that I'm not comfortable with. I and it. I think that this handbook, had it been done really deeply through the lens of the, the equity outcomes that we're looking for, would look and sound different. So I think part of what I'm hearing is that as we go forward to do our equity plan and our strategic planning in, you know, more broadly, that um, making sure that we're thinking about, you know, about the issues that you're raising should be part of that. I sort of look at these handbooks as not, um, you know, or at least at this moment, I'm looking at them as reflecting what we are doing and telling our families and our community what we're doing versus charting a new course. So I think that this, this it doesn't have to be that way, but I think that is um, where we are. Our handbooks- We wanna tell the community? I'm telling the community right now that I think our handbooks are telling our, like those, those three elementary, middle and high school handbooks. I think they're, in, they're providing information about um, what, what you can expect, you know, to have to do to graduate. It's just got a, a bunch of information in it. I, I think you're, to, what I'm thinking, it may not, I don't want to, you know, I can't, speak for you, obviously. So what I'm feeling is that we need to be looking at these issues and that's a big undertaking. Um, and I think it might occur best as part of 
the strategic planning and the equity planning that we are about to embark on. Um, so I'm, you know, that, that's just a response that I'm offering as you discuss your issues here. Um, you know, maybe adding my thought is maybe we need to look at that in a broad way as we go through that that process. Yeah, I would offer we absolutely need to look at it broad way. And I also worry like we plop a 79 page document, you know, with well to us, but that's sort of separate, but also to educators, right? So what is the infrastructure for implementation, right? What does that look like in an individual classroom teacher? Right. How do they implement it? And in what ways, like it was a whole list of differentiation strategies. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And OK, so that's awesome. How what supports are in place to make sure that that's happening? Because those those are not gifted strategies. Right. Those are good right. teaching strategies. Right. right. Those are good teaching right. strategies for all students. Mm -hmm. So are those strategies just living in the gifted classrooms or are those strategies just living in the spaces where gifted kids are clustered or are those strategies that we are saying are going to be present in all classrooms for all children? Right. So I. I am concerned with the message that this sends because it is alignment with a culture that we've created that I'm not sure is serving all students. Can I ask a question? Is the gift get handbook part of a requirement when you submit a plan to Ohio Department of Education that family, or is this just an addition that came out of um, the gifted task force um, committee work? Yeah, this, is, this, is, this has been in place. What you see in the green is what we updated. Right. No, I understand, but is the handbook part of- I don't think it's required by law. Um, so it's something that we have consistently provided to families um, so that they at least know if you're in this identification and classification world of being A or B, not to simplify it to that degree, here's what happens if you are part of that in Bexley to um, I do think it's a deeper broader conversation um, that is part of that sort of implementation of our equity plan um, uh, that we that work that we need to do but I don't know what I'm not sure I'm hearing Marguerite is um, is it just the, the, the physicality of a handbook existing in the first place that you want to go away? Or is it just the language that's in the handbook that you want to have changed? Because I'm just not sure um, where we're going. I, I just, I want to better understand where we're going with right. the discussion. I get that, you know, you want to have a brief, broader, deeper discussion. And I think there's a place for that. But the handbook is a, a sort of a guidebook, not only for our families, but also for- um, Right, but language is a representation of values. I'm, right? not, I'm not debating that. I'm asking what, what language do you want to see change so that we can make those recommendations? So and, I would want, if you look on, on page 34, both sections, right? Why I prepare my students for testing? Why should I prepare that? What, what are the underlying, why would a parent even think they needed to prepare? Right, that's a question. And then I think if you look at the next one, the testing covered skills, that the testing is covering skills that my child hasn't been taught. And sort of the, our response, right, is that, well, some kids don't need to be taught that. And what I would push back and say, some kids have experienced, some kids are explicitly taught it, they're just not taught it in the classroom because they've got two college educated parents or somebody who's a professor, they travel, they've got all of the, it's more about access and opportunity. Right. It's not necessarily about so our gifted assessments don't always they don't necessarily always assess giftedness. Right. They also assess access and opportunity. Right. And so when you look at at this one, I would like us to talk about in whether it lives in this policy, it lives somewhere else. Having writing this and not sort of unpacking and speaking to that, I think, is problematic. Right. Not pushing back on the fact that it's not just that some kids learn it. it where that would, what's the line in here? Um, without explicitly being taught, right? Some kids have opportunities to learn things outside of school that then position them differently to be successful on gifted tests and then to test high, right? Like mm -hmm. that is the, so let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Whether we talk about it here, whether we talk about the equity policy, but when we put stuff um, 
out like this, where we don't interrogate some of the inequities that live in the systems that produce these inequitable outcomes, then we are sort of complicit in them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm gonna, you know this, but of course, a lot of this is coming from state law. Um, but I, I'm- Our handbook? No, the language that we're talking about, oh, you know, like sorry, the testing, mm -hmm. we're, we're required to do that. We're required, you know, they tell us the test, they tell us, what a you know gifted percentile is they all of that is dictated to us so um, we can take the language out of the handbook but we can't change the law on it mm -hmm. you know it's it's just it's imposed so um, you know I think the handbook is intended to I, I mean I, I but I think the handbook is talking about how we are responding to the law right this is what Bexley City Schools is doing in response to the laws related to gifted. Isn't that so, accurate? Some of it is, yeah. Yeah. So we have options about how we are going to respond to that law. I'm not sure. sure. I don't currently feel like this document is representative so of the options. So I think options. that's where I'm asking right. what, yes. what options or language gets us to a point where we inform our families of information that, I mean, some of this document this handbook it has had some iterations have come from just feedback from our families saying you didn't tell me about this or we'd like to know this information. Um, the extensive work that the task force engaged in just to ask families that are part of the gifted um, community now you know if your position is then that they should have just went to everybody in the district and asked their feedback no i'm just saying as a as a as a suggestion to get more feedback yes we could have done that but we were specifically speaking to that particular audience those teachers that uh, you know all of those folks gave this hand feedback that goes all into this handbook so all this document does is say why you should prepare your kid, student for a test. We get that in newsletters when we have state testing every, <laughs> we have state testing all the time. We get in, in newsletters, make sure they get a good night's sleep, make sure they have a, a breakfast and make sure they have a good meal and don't stress them out. Like they give us tips. And so I look at a handbook in that regard to your point about value statements, words do matter. And so I, I'm, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, what language you want to see or you know be added into this document that supports our value system and i think what you're saying victoria is that's where that conversation will take over into development of our plan and equity um so i i'm just trying to get to where like i get that you have a problem with it and i get that you have a problem with the structures that you know, a lot of public school systems and beyond, certainly private school systems um, face and deal with, but I'm trying to understand what language you want. What am I voting for? Like if you pulled it from to, to vote and discuss, what do you want to see? Do you want that whole line struck? Like what, what um, edits do you want changed? That's so what I, I, I'm, I'm happy to offer some edits. I can't do it right now today Gotcha. in this meeting which is kind of what I said at the beginning. Which is why it's a first read. Right, and that's, but it, it's a first read of a 79 page document that we got five days ago. So mm -hmm. I have three pages of notes, probably not ones that I would submit right this second today. Sure, sure. And, and um, you don't have to submit them to me. I'm not so, demanding those. I'm just um, saying but I if think there's that edits. What I'm offering is that there's some room for growth. Gotcha. Um, in embedding an mm -hmm. equity lens into this handbook. Gotcha. So let's, um, you know, if you've got specific changes to this handbook, why don't you get them to us and we'll, you know, get them to Dr. Fine and we'll figure, you know, look at those. Um, don't know whether they can be made or not because, you know, right. I'm not I'm in charge of that. And But but then we... What's the timeline for when we circulate the handbook in the first place? Those go, we try to get those out because course uh, course options are happening. When I think about this handbook, the elementary, middle and high school, especially the upper grades, we want that in the hands of our families so that they have access to refer to as they're making some of those decisions. So to be fair, um, the, the, the size of the document, obviously, and if 
if you know members of the board have edits that are um, significant, what's the timeline to get those back to you and have those reviewed in time to have it before us before second read? It all comes down to once we get edits, we work as a team, we make those changes. It, however long it takes to get to us, then delays the time I'm going to get it to you. Hmm. So, but we're we're flexible. We we want to work together. Uh, it 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 compounds the issue that you've ex, you've experienced in the last couple of weeks, where I've got five days to read all of these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we get the ability to update, and I would want to work with our team and and uh, get your feedback. I'm trying to it think. It comes when, down to how fast we can get it back to you. When did we first get the edits for the gifted handbook? It was a few weeks ago. I don't remember. I think it was in a weekend update. Yep, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and Marguerite, you feel like that's still not enough time to get through. Um, I'm just trying to give some feedback in terms of like when we throw it into the policy rotation for policy review. If, and I think this goes back to when we discussed it in our retreat, if we know that it's coming, mm -hmm. so like, I I only look at it, I only remember the last one. Yep. The handbook has been in our weekend updates at least a couple of times, I think. So um, as soon as we get them, as soon as we get our drafts, we will make sure you've got access. Y y huh? Yeah. Whenever, you, or when, it may even be in yeah, a, this, this may be in a separate email. That's and right. I'm okay with just the call out, like, hey, this isn't coming right on Wednesday. Correct. This is, you know, weeks out. That way, you know, 10 pages are a little easier to digest at mm -hmm. a time than 79 when we've got a, mm -hmm. a ton of other. And like with the um, policies, policies, we'll make an effort. I'm speaking for the superintendent here, but I'm hearing that he's going to make an effort to forward that stuff to us as it becomes available yeah. and, and the policies as well. Yeah. And I, and I can't speak to my, my brain is in the same arena. I think it was in weekend updates. I'd have to double check. I, I, I Dr. Boyle, I feel like we received the handbook a couple of times in your weekend update to us. I believe this staff at least once in the weekend update uh, Definitely more than a week ago, but I believe it's okay. So. All right. Um, just that's just you know some yeah. I, feedback I think might be helpful when we're um, looking at like a really big document because sure. then that the gives folks time to really digest what we're being asked to whether we vote on the sure. first read or not. Right. Um, hey, here's some updates to take the policy committee, which I think are really profound. Um, uh, it's really profound feedback, mm -hmm. you know, and ones that we need to, to be considerate of. All right. Um, good discussion. Um, I would like to entertain a motion to um, acknowledge that we have had a first reading of the um, handbook that is at um, 4J. Is there a motion? It's so moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor of that acknowledgement, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. That motion carries. Um, next is um, M, approval of the um, public information officer job description. I think I asked for this to be pulled out, and I think it was kind of by mistake. I just want. <laughs> um, I, I, I think we, and I was like, I think we already talked about this, but I wasn't sure. Just about the, so we don't, may not really need to pull it out. It was really just about the language around we're combining the two. You talked about it, yep. so I think yep. I pulled it out, and then it was like, that's fine. I feel like we right. talked about it, That's so we can nope. unpull it out. That's fine. Very nope. I do note that there's a like a typo or two in there that I just mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give it to you. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's vote on that one. Um, acknowledging a first re, re and oh no, this is one that, so my comments, my changes are just moving a comma really. Right. And then a couple of things where there's plurals just for consistency. Yeah, so there's easy. no content, no substantive change. Um, 
Do I have a motion to approve the PIO job description that's at 4M? I make the motion that you that uh, grammar errors um, be made. And then approve. And then, and then approve. And then yeah. we, we can approve it now with those. Yeah. Okay. Right. So moved. A second? Second. We have time for questions. I'm sorry. Yes, I thought we were done with that. I apologize. Yes. Um, so assuming that we were to pass or approve the, the language here, um, what do you think be the timeline for posting? Yeah, the goal is to post, I would say, early next week. We're processing what that process will look like. Um, we're going to send it out to lots of avenues. Uh, we're, we're hopeful that we will get somebody that can come in here and do, it's not an easy task. It's not an easy job to come in and do the things that we have expected from Tyler and Gianna combined. Yeah, and I think that we definitely want this kind of hand and glove relationship between the district and the uh, uh, this, right. this role as things happen quickly and we would be clear. Um, I, I'm also looking at this relative to our other financial mm -hmm. concerns, right? So, so I'm looking at this position and a few others and how, I think we have a retreat coming up here. I think I like to have a little conversation about how this fits in with other. The public information officer? Yeah. I think the conversations that we're having about the current structure is, is really important and, and I welcome the conversation. I think the public information mm -hmm. officer, the funding is there. It is a, we will not function without the public information officer uh, coming in that's effective to come in and do that work. I don't see a world where a public information officer is not part of of this makeup, but I welcome the conversation, love the conversation. Um, taking the, the funding of what we've been paying our public information officer, taking what we've been paying Allerton Hill and the firm, I, I see a world where we will be spending less on uh, communications compared to what we have been. Uh, but once we see this play out, we'll know more. Yeah, and I think kind of comparable to the conversation about the gifted uh, handling. We had to almost kind of take a step back to see how it reads. Mm -hmm. So, you know, otherwise, we just kind of repeat the cycle of making minor edits and keep on going, right? And so, I think the same thing here, like, okay, let's take a step back and just think about our uh, core executive relationship. Mm -hmm. You just think about those for a second. Yeah, so like a PIO makes total sense. But if we don't have a time to kind of pause, we just kind of keep on repeating everything right. over and over again. So I'm just kind of pausing and thinking about things a little bit. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments on? Um, so we had a motion and a second. All in favor of approval of this revised job description, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. And then the last one that we pulled out is the exempt salary um, range. And this document has been updated um, to move the PIO position from exempt level three to exempt level four, which Dr. Fine already talked about. Uh, in his um, remarks, uh, just permitting us to um, essentially um, increase the opportunity that the pay scale for that position, um, recognizing that we believe that we would eventually save money from reducing or eliminating our contract with Allerton Hill. Yes. Did, did you, does anybody have any questions or comments on this one? Okay. Um, So I will. I think that's the one she pulled out, though. She wanted yeah. to discuss. Yeah, I don't think. Oh, she oh that's the. I think we're good, right? Yeah. You're good. Sorry. You're good. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So I'm glad we pulled it out. 
Okay. So um, a motion to. Before we get your chance. No, thank you. A motion to approve um, 4N, the revised exempt salary procedure. So moved. Thank you. And a second? I'll second. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. Can I just, before you go into the next one. So I looked through the April 1st, I looked through the April 8th, the first time we got, we did get a bunch of, Harley sent a bunch of um, handbooks yeah. on the 6th, but the first time yeah. that I can see in my email that we got the gifted handbook was on the 7th, which had been last Thursday. Mm. I just remember reading it in, I in advance. All, I, I just at, remember reading it in advance of um, the agenda coming out. So I, you know, of course, I wasn't trying to assume or accuse. I just really, I, I was giving feedback to our administration that if we have, the the yes, the sooner, really the sooner the better, especially um, if there are um, underlying um, yeah. issues that we wanna address and, and call the question. We wanna make sure that things like as simple as our handbook are aligned to everything else that we're doing sure. so yeah all right thank you for all of that um mr smith thank you i'll be brief uh just now noticed this too sometimes when you copy and paste things um from one agenda to the next we're approving the march financials not the january's <laughs> oh. um thank you. so this will will change that yep um the attachment is the march um, nothing too significant um, standing out in the March financials. We uh, find we have our final property tax collections uh, that came in at the very end of the month, uh, doing just a little bit better than forecasted, which is always a, a good thing. Uh, April, we will have our final income tax collection. And after that, we'll pretty much be done collecting revenue um, after this month. One other thing in this month is line 1.05 property tax allocation. Uh, we'll receive that from the state uh, as well, uh, I believe this month. I just was talking with someone from ODE and it was approved uh, this week to be sent out. On the expenditure side, salaries continue to do better. Um, that's the probably the best part of um, on the expenditures. Everything else is um, running a little bit hot. Purchase services, um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Supplies and materials is doing better, um, but that is going to be a timing thing as near the end of the year, things really pick up and we've got some um, expenditures coming our way in that category. Um, and then just to address a couple of things that that's been mentioned tonight, Ms. Powers, you did a wonderful job explaining 126. Um, I, I don't think I have anything further to say. Um, House Bill 601, which was the pension reform, just so this board knows, that would cost this district nine hundred to a million dollars, nine hundred thousand to a million dollars extra by the time it's fully implemented. That's phased right now. It's phased in. I think it's very early in in its existence. Um, the bill. The bill. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that would be that. That'd be a significant expenditure for us. House Bill 601? Yes. When is that expected to like? Don't know. I don't even, there, I, I've heard, I got a huge update this morning for about two hours on legislation and they're all, they all mixed together. So I um, can relate with Ms. Powers, but I don't know that if that even has a sponsor with, or uh, um, if others have co-signed onto it, but. I'm curious how it, that timing would hit our um, collective bargaining. Uh, it really wouldn't mm -hmm. um, because that's not part of, um, well, actually I'd have to look at our, it's an employer contribution. It's not an employee contribution. So we would not, that really wouldn't impact collective bargaining. It, it impacts the, the money that we have available to do anything whether it's collective bargaining or right anything right. Um, because that's pretty significant out of mm -hmm. a 40 million 44 million dollar budget big number yeah um to 
just add on about the BEF theater purchases. Um, we, as a district, are also contributing to that project as well, um, using using permanent improvement dollars. So we use that for not only just maintenance or athletics, but also in the arts as well. So I wanted to point that out. And then also in the treasure section of the agenda, there are several things that um, I really can't speak to as your treasure regarding English language arts, but we kind of put it there because uh, of the purchases. Uh, they, they exceed $25,000 and, and are uh, significant purchases. So um, we've just kind of slotted them in here. And I believe we do have um, Dr. Boyle to, to talk to us in 5D. But before I do that, I'll uh, open it up for any questions um, on the financials, um, the renewal of the meta service agreement. Um, I'll leave it there. Sorry, I asked my questions early. No, I, <laughs> you, you know, I don't mind that. Anybody have any questions about any of um, Kyle's section five? A through F other than um, E. Kyle, I just have one question. Our purchase services, could you just explain what that line would entail? Because I know we're running a little bit higher than forecasted. Uh, yeah, so that line is actually lower. It supplies this. It's, oh, no, I'm sorry. You're right. Higher. Sorry. Looking at the wrong line. Um, that is That holds a lot. So that is utilities. That is our substitute teachers, our um, classroom and special education aides come out of there. Um, some, a, a lot of um, support services for students that uh, we may not be able to provide in-house mm -hmm. that are maybe one-offs, um, professional development is in there. And, um, but the, the big players are our um, substitute teachers, utilities, and our classroom and special education aides. Those are the big players. And the ELA curriculum that we're going to be talking about, that would be more on the supplies material. Yes, it would be. It'd be a textbook supply. Yes. Okay. Because that will bump that line. Depending on when we pay it. Yes. Okay, if we'd pay before, if we'd pay before June 30th, uh, it would, it'd show up in that line. We've got it budgeted for this year. Um, okay. It just depends on when we receive and pay. But we originally were thinking when you did your four five year forecast, it really would have been last year, right? If we because isn't it yeah, last year that line was significantly under budget. Yeah. And we didn't have really any curriculum adoptions, I, I believe, because of our right. inability to meet and discuss because of COVID. Right. Okay. Thank you. I was gonna tell you, uh, uh Kyle, my purchase services line is it's like it gives me nightmares when I look at it. So when I saw it on the budget, I mean, I've seen it before. I'm just like, oh, this makes me the, nauseous. As you all know, I was with treasures the last three days and the big, the big words are inflation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you'll, you'll, you'd see that in purchase services and supplies. Um, and we're already seeing it now. Um, Sourcing equipment is awful. Right. Delays and, and you name it. Um, I mean, from delays and finding personnel from delays to, mm -hmm finding whatever, um, food. At this We're point, pencils. <laughs> it's just hard to so, get anything, anything. That's what, yeah, I, I believe ch we've had so issues with. <laughs> yeah. But overall, even though we're over, you look at that bottom number down there. I think that's important. Not yeah, the, the very bottom is, is, is looking great. Um, a lot of that is due. I mean, luckily, the, at least the way it looks right now, our revenue is is um, keeping up yeah. with that. Um, the lines 1.035 and 1.04 are going to change by the end of the year um, because of how state funding is going to work with us. And we'll talk a lot about state funding in the May forecast next month, right. um, how that's looking for us. Um, but yeah. Okay. So before we head to Colleen, just a huge thank you to Kyle. Kyle, I know you all know, is an incredible asset to this district. And some districts have unique relationships between the superintendent and the treasurer, and it can, it can be a challenge. I'm just so grateful for what Kyle does. And Kyle jokingly says, I, I don't know a lot about ELA curriculum. He digs in. He knows what's going on throughout the district. He's very... Uh, 
intentional about advocating for what's best for kids. So I'm thankful that you're here and, and appreciate all that you do. Appreciate that. I just didn't want questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's out of the bag. Now we're on to you. <laughs> okay. So um, let's entertain a motion to approve section five. Uh, um, B, C, E, and F. So moved. Or, yes. So I forgot what I'm doing. You're so doing moved. It. And a second, please. Second. Thank you. All in favor of those items, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. And then we're going to do the. Yes, Dr. Boyle tonight will be sharing an update on that. Is that all right? We go. Yeah. On the ELA curriculum review with specific focus on the elementary process of revision and resource adoption. While curriculum maps and course guides will be shared with the board next month, tonight, Dr. Boyle will talk specifically about the elementary resources selected by a representative teacher team. Uh, take it away. All right. Well, thank you for having me come speak with you. Kyle actually has probably learned more about ELA curriculum in the last couple of weeks than he's ever cared to. Um, but I appreciate that he takes an interest and in asks the questions. So I am gonna just give an update on our process. I will touch briefly on 612, but as Dr. Fine mentioned, the focus tonight really is on the K-5 resource adoption for ELA. Um, curriculum review is usually a five to six year process. Year one for ELA actually started in the 1920 school year um, under Ms. Abraham, she was pulling together teams from all across the district, and they worked on developing a vision, hallmarks, and a strong framework for ELA instruction. Of course, then, right as that work was really gaining ground, a pandemic hit, and it put it all on pause. And so that work was paused through last year with the exception of the diversity, equity, inclusion audit that we did with 612 curriculum and texts. We picked up the process again this year. And so our 612 teachers really have just taken what they learned through that audit last year and have been incorporating that into their curriculum maps, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but really the focus was on revisiting the work that was done in the 1920 school year, updating and modifying to reflect where we are now two years later, um, values that we hold, changes in what we know about practice to try and, and really be most current with that. And this is also the year that we would look at resource adoptions. So <clears throat> continuing on, um, I will touch briefly on 612. As I mentioned before, and as several of you were aware from last year, we did do an audit using the culturally responsive education scorecard that's developed by NYU for using um, uh, for doing a review of ELA curriculum. We focused on 612 last year and this year, our 612 teams have been working on updating their course guides and curriculum maps, making some changes to both required and optional texts for students and refining those curriculum maps and course guides to reflect those changes. They also have been working diligently on, as we indicated we wanted to do in the commitment plan, coming up with some common writing assessments that we can use across the board. Those changes and updates will be presented to you within the next week or two in anticipation of the main meeting. So you'll get more details about that as we go. So then in K-5, our focus this year was also on updating our curriculum maps, identifying key resource needs and developing writing assessments. Again, just in line with what we've talked about with the um, commitment plan and the updated maps and writing assessment information will come to you with the 612 updates for next month. Today, we're just going to really focus in on that resource need piece. So we started by working with our grade level teams. I need to give a shout out to our grade level chairs for K-5 because they really were sort of the go-between between the classroom teachers and all approximately 60 K-5 classroom teachers and the coaches and me and for a while Ms. Abraham and trying to really take a look at what our resource needs were. And part of the work that our grade level chairs did was lead their grade level teams through a review of what our existing district adopted resources are and how those align to the core elements of ELA instruction. What areas were, are we good and what areas do we have a gap? And what we discovered is that, and this wasn't really a surprise to us, we had a really 
strong foundational skills program with the adoption of foundations and we have some word study skills programs available through mega words, um, but the grade level teams in all grade levels noted that we don't have a common district wide resource for teaching reading writing language and vocabulary across our grade levels. Um, teachers really have been in many ways given a lot of academic freedom to use resources and tools that are best suited to their classrooms. But the flip side to that is without that commonality, we, we can't ensure that there's some consistency of the quality of instruction in every classroom across the district. So the other part to this is, as many of you may know, Ohio has adopted a new law addressing dyslexia screening and support. And so we wanted to make sure that we have resources in house that will help us make, meet the needs of kids who may be at risk of dyslexia and really help our teachers address those needs. It was this kind of push and pull between wanting some structure and framework that lends consistency while also giving teachers the space to use their creativity and to be flexible to meet the needs of their students. And then finally, one of the other key pieces that came out of our conversation about our resource needs is really recognizing the range of students that we have. Um, we have students who need some intense interventions and reading supports, and we wanted to make sure we had the resource to do, to do that. We also have students who are highly advanced readers or who are identified as students who have other thinking critical reasoning needs. And so we wanted to make sure that the resources we adopt met the needs of those two groups and everybody in between, that we wanted to do something that would encourage critical thinking and reasoning for all of our students. And some programs are better at that than others. So together, the grade level chairs, the coaches and I talked about what we wanted to use as criteria to evaluate our programs. Um, there were three key pieces that we looked at. The first was looking at the Ed Reports reviews. Ed Reports is a nonprofit group made up of educators that evaluates curriculum. They look for primarily based on alignment to standards, not just surface alignment, but really deep alignment. In ELA, they're focused on text quality and complexity. And then only programs that meet that rigorous review of text quality and complexity go on to be further rated for usability, both by students and teachers. Um, they're also looking to make sure that the programs develop knowledge through literacy. And then those reports are shared publicly. Ohio Department of Education and Info Ohio have partnered together with Ed Reports to come up with this site called Ohio Materials Matter that really helps guide districts in choosing the highest quality materials. So those reviews were our starting point when we were looking at what programs we wanted to take a, a deeper dive with. The second piece that was really important as we were looking at choosing a program was being culturally responsive. And so again, we brought out the culturally responsive scorecard from NYU. It's the same scorecard we used with 612 last year. And we wanted to make sure we were applying that to programs as we were looking at them. And then finally, as the grade level chairs had worked with their grade level teams, they gave input on what they felt would be necessary and valuable in a program. And we developed an in-house rubric to rate programs based on the criteria that came straight from our classroom teachers who would be using this with our students. So we began with a list of 13 programs that included some that were highly rated, ones that we had heard positive things about from colleagues and other school districts, and some programs that teachers in our district had been using independently for periods of time. The grade level chairs, coaches, and I took that list and we narrowed it down to six based on a surface review. The six that we thought that just from first glance and looking at those ad reports reviews would probably deserve the greatest um, attention and real critical look. And so then with that, we brought our grade level chairs and a whole slew of other people to form our resource review team. In some years, we would have done a pilot because our teachers really communicated to us that they've got a lot on their plate and they really were looking for a representation of them to do this deep dive work. They, they, they were making it clear to us that they were kind of at capacity. So we brought together this representative team. You'll see that we have classroom teachers from every grade level. We also have included, oh, made sure that we had representation from every building. And then we wanted to make sure we had specialists that work with various student groups be involved with this. Um, our 
elementary specialist for English learners is not on that list. He was unable to attend the day that we did our review, but he did provide input to us um, separately that we then used in our feedback. So on March 24th, that team came together, but prior to March 24th, we communicated the information about the six programs we were reviewing to all of our K-5 staff. We also sent them a link to a survey that they could use to provide feedback and invited anybody who had any thoughts, questions, comments to please submit that to us and that we would include that in our review with the team. On the 24th of March, the team came together and did a look at both print and digital samples that those companies provided to us. It was really interesting as sort of an side observer to listen to their conversation. Um, each grade level and each member of the team did individual rankings, but as they were examining the materials, they were certainly allowed and encouraged to converse with one another. And it was neat to watch teachers point out different features that maybe their colleagues had missed or something that really stood out as stellar or challenging to them and have that conversation. Um, as we went through the day, we would dedicate a certain amount of time to each of the programs, and after they had their time to review, each individual person would then do a rating for the program using our locally designed rubric, and then they would select a random unit from the program to do the culturally responsive education scorecard. So that's how we were able to balance the two. After we went through all of six of the programs, we had a debriefing time at the end where we looked at what the individual ratings were, um, everyone had a chance to share what they thought were strengths of the programs, what the challenges were. Um, it was, again, interesting because we had K-5 there and some of our specialists to hear the different considerations that each of them had along the way. And after that deliberation, I asked each of them individually to rank the six programs, top choice to sixth choice. And I was expecting there to be some differences of opinion, but the first go round, we had a near unanimous top choice and it took less than five minutes of conversation afterwards to get to 100% consensus. I have never in my years of teaching been with a group that came to consensus that quickly and they, they all felt very strongly about this particular program that we chose. So the program that the team selected is called Wit and Wisdom. It's published by Great Minds Publishing. This program focuses primarily on reading comprehension and writing. Um, what stood out is that it is a natural complement to the foundations program that our K-3 teachers already use. And that was something that we heard from many of them. They did not want to change foundational skills programs because of the learning curve. So this program allows them to bring on something new without having to relearn everything. There's some familiarity that goes with this. The program uses trade books and literature as the text sources, as opposed to a condensed basil. We liked the idea of having authentic books in kids' hands. And the curriculum is centered on themes that are rooted in science and social studies. So we're building academic knowledge and academic vocabulary along the way. One of the other standout features of this program is that there are thinking routines and graphic organizers that are consistent throughout the whole program. They're starting to be introduced in K and they're built upon in first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade. So across the years, the students really have those instructional and thinking routines reinforced and allows them to become experts in approaches that utilize executive functioning skills, critical thinking and collaboration, all of those things that we heard Steve talk about earlier. Um, there, there's opportunities for that within this program. Um, the common strategies and graphic organizers, along with scaffolds that are incorporated throughout the teaching manuals, will help provide supports for our students with disabilities. The other thing that was unique is that Wit and Wisdom is a partner with the English Learners Success Forum, which has resulted in recommendations for supporting English learners using this specific curriculum. It was the only one of the six that we looked at that has that partnership with the English Learners Success Forum. And then additionally, the broad unit themes, the level of questioning and text complexity throughout and the flexibility to bring in additional text at varying reading levels really allows our teachers to differentiate for our highest readers and our readers who need the most support. And when we did the review of diverse representation in text, I will say that this program scored second highest of the six. Um, it was just a fraction of a point below the top scoring one. 
in full disclosure, all six programs were middle of the road. There was no stellar program that stood out on that culturally responsive scorecard. Um, however, I'm gonna show you some resources on the next slide that we are asking to purchase in addition to this that we feel will strengthen that representation in the text that our primary students have access to. And then last year, we had an opportunity to purchase classroom libraries for our fourth and fifth grade classrooms through a grant with the Bexley Education Foundation. And that purchase was made specifically to provide increased access to texts that are representative of many people groups. And one of our elementary librarians has already taken the time to go through those purchases that we made last spring and align them to all of the units for wit and wisdom. So that way when our teachers open the curriculum, they already know how they can slide those texts in and have it make sense with what we do with our students. Um, finally, the, the staff really felt like this program was user-friendly for both students and teachers. Some of the programs that we received came with a million pieces and one of watching one of the teachers try and model what she would do juggling all the different books. It, it was kind of funny to watch as she, she needed to be an octopus really to have enough hands to handle it. This particular program has enough additional pieces to provide the extensions and supports we need without overwhelming our teachers and our students with the materials. And they really felt like if we have a teacher who's absent one day, a guest teacher can come in, can pick it up and continue instruction so that our students don't miss out on reading instruction because of an illness or family emergency. So we felt like it, it really gave a solid framework for consistency, but there is still room for teachers to bring in texts that their students love that aren't necessarily assigned in here and, and really respond to that unique group of students that they face each school year. So the supplemental resources that we're also wanting to purchase are called geodes. These are decodable texts for our primary students. These are also published by Great Minds, the same company that publishes Wit and Wisdom. What is unique about this set of decodable texts that was different from the other five programs is that the sequence of phonic skills introduced in these texts aligns perfectly with foundations. It doesn't, the other programs that we looked at Everything was in a different order, and actually some of the order didn't match what we learned from research about the sequence in which you should introduce phonics sounds, or phonics skills to our students. So um, we really felt like this was a great complement to what we already have. They're what I would call a modern decodable text. I'm sure we all experienced those decodable texts when we were kids, you know, the fat cat is sat or something like that. These have much more interesting storylines and sentence structure so that they're engaging for our students, but still very calculated in how they introduce and reinforce sounds. So um, we will purchase with your approval, a set of these for each of our buildings this year. Um, once we see how they are incorporated, we will revisit whether we want to purchase additional sets, but we feel like one set per building will really get the ball rolling with our teachers to be able to use these with our students. Um, we felt like this was also a really critical piece because we have noticed a slight decline in our KRA literacy scores for incoming kindergartners this year. We also noticed a slight dip in our MAP scores in the fall for our first graders. And, and we really feel like some of this has to do with the fact that COVID hit when those students would have been in preschool and having those early literacy experiences. So by using these types of resources now, we can close those gaps right away before they take hold and become a bigger issue for our students. Um, and finally, they, these will be a great tool to use with our students who are at risk of dyslexia. They support some of the science of reading work that we've seen and really will complement that foundations program and other multi-sensory structured literacy programs that we have. So um, tonight you were presented with legislation to both approve the adoption of these resources for our elementary ELA program and the approval of the expenditure. Um, upon that approval, we'll place our order and we'll begin working with the company to plan for implementation so we can hit the ground running in the fall. And that will include staff training, both initial launch training and ongoing support. Actually, um, Jana Clark, who's behind me and has been hugely instrumental in helping this work come along and getting our curriculum maps in place and making sure everybody has the information they need. Um, she and I have already been talking about what do we need to be doing throughout the school year to make sure our teachers are able to implement that. And then we'll also be thinking about what evidence do we collect along the way to, to see what kind of impact it's having because the cycle will begin again in five years and we wanna make sure that 
as the years progress that we really know, is this being effective with our students? So that will incorporate a lot of measures, um, both achievement measures, but also classroom observations, feedback that we'll gather from community members and, and teachers and their use with that. Um, we also will be developing some additional reading lists with suggested trade book titles that teachers may want to use to expand upon the units. Those will be living documents that we can continually add to as new high quality, high interest texts are both published and discovered along the way. Um, one of the other things I mentioned earlier tonight that is also part of this process is we are working on our plan for implementing Ohio's new dyslexia law. Our district dyslexia team will actually have their first meeting tomorrow. Um, we will be able to do some preliminary work. We are actually in a holding pattern on the vast majority of it as we wait for the Ohio Department of Education and State Board of Education to come to terms with what the guidance will be and to approve the assessment so that we can decide what our screeners will be. But our team will be meeting tomorrow to start to make some decisions about things we can and anticipate other decisions to come. Uh, but I, I will say that we are really excited. Um, our staff is excited to have a new resource and to be able to have some consistency. And so we just thank you for your ongoing support of that work. Thank you so much. That's super helpful, great detail. Um, does anybody have any questions about the um, proposal or the funding? Yeah, but quick question. Thanks, that was super thorough. I appreciate that, Colleen. And I appreciate, I know you sent some quite answers to the questions I'd given before. I'm curious, um, how, oh shoot. <laughs> oh. You, 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 as Steve mentioned, and you reiterated that teachers are super overwhelmed right now. So I'm, I'm curious why this is a hugely complex process, mm -hmm. right? Where like, you really want to get in as many voices as you can into the process because you're going to, because it's a big shift, right? People have been able to kind of do their thing. And now you're asking them to do a standardized thing. And that's going to cause some feelings for people, particularly people who have been teaching the way they've been teaching for a long time. And now you're asking them to teach a different way. Mm -hmm. having been an educator for 30 years, I'm fully aware of the feelings that exist. Sure. Um, or I can presume some of the feelings that exist. You would so, presume it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just wondering why it felt important to do this now when we know people are a little bit over it. Like how much engagement could you get when people are kind of feeling like, and then are you setting yourself up potentially for people's feelings to be exacerbated because they were too overwhelmed to engage in the process and now they're gonna to have to do it. So I'm just curious on what the, why it felt like now was the time. It's a great question. I will be perfectly honest with you. When we went into this conversation this year, we fully anticipated we would not be adopting a single resource for the district. We really felt like um, our teachers wouldn't want that. We thought that we know that they very much value their freedom and flexibility. And so when we started the conversations about finishing the curriculum maps and the framework, and we talked about, okay, let's, we're going to build off of what we have and not adopt a resource, we received instantaneous pushback from the teachers. They made it very clear to us that they wanted something provided by the district in hand because the not having one was more overwhelming to them than the thought of bringing on something new. And I, I will say that we, we hear both sides of that from our staff, but the overwhelming majority opinion was we need something. They felt like they were spending more time trying to pull together tier one whole instruction resources and didn't have enough time to differentiate for student needs. And so what they communicated to us was by us bringing on a resource that would take care of the tier one and then they could focus their time on differentiation. So it was an interesting push pull. And to be very honest, it was very surprising to me. So when you talk about, you know, the teachers said, are you talking about, like, are you surveying? So you said there's 60 teachers who this is impacting. So like overwhelming, like 40 of the 60, 50 of the 60. That conversation actually occurred during grade level team meetings. So all of our K-5 teachers were involved in those conversations and they had small group conversations with their grade level chairs and an administrator was present at each of those conversations as well, just to, to take notes. But our grade level chairs really led that conversation. And so it was really input from 
all 60 of them. I, I say 60, that's my rough number I've been using as we calculate sections for extra, but about 60. So it was the grade level chairs who brought that data back to you on what their team said. And I sat in on some of the meetings as well. So I, I got to hear the principals, actually the principals echoed the same thing that the grade level chairs were telling me that came back from their team. And I was hearing that theme at my if you recall, I think in December, January, I was spending time in each building and that was a theme that continued to come up in those conversations. One thing I just in my time of serving on school board that I've often heard um, teachers share is just the the constant change like they get set in one direction or um, one I don't know what to call it. I'm sorry. This is my lack of expertise here. But, you know, and then we got to switch it because the standards have changed and, and they may have just now got to the point where they got a system down. And that's where I, I can see where you had all the different alignment. We had three different elementary schools for 20 plus years, all teaching a different philosophy around literacy. So it wasn't until about five years ago that the school board started just asking a very simple question, why? You know, if we're seeing this data come out around test scores that didn't support why we did all these different, and we would have these long-winded presentations around best practices, and they were best practices, but they were best practices for some and not all. So I'm really, I'm really, really thankful for all of the um, work that has gone into sort of um, aligning that process. And uh, Ms. Clark, I have seen her many, many times um, <laughs> telling us these very things. So thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt your line of question, no. Marguerite. I guess I'm curious. So this is a big change, right? And so what, what systems or structures are in place for supporting implementation? Like to, to Alicia's point, right? You're going from a looser structure around ELA instruction to a tight structure, right. right? Or a tighter structure. You've said there's gonna be some leeway for teacher professionalism and choice and autonomy in their implementation process, but you're still, this is a big undertaking at an incredibly stressful time. Absolutely. So what does that look like for 60 educators to understand what implementation is gonna be going into next year like what is the what's the plan for professional development so that plan i'll be honest is still under development for a couple of reasons um one we know that there are some pieces we know ahead of time um, we are aiming to submit the purchase order tomorrow actually and with our goal being if we can get the order processed we're hoping then that our teachers will have at the very least access to all of the resources digitally over the summer we've had several teachers say they want as much time to preview it as possible not that we expect them to look at it over their summer. I want to be really clear on that, but they have asked for it. And so the earlier we can get that order, the sooner we can get those materials into their hand, which will help instantly alleviate, I think, some of the anxiety some may be feeling. The other piece is we know that when they come back to school, there will be a full day launch training led by the company that will walk them through here's what you need to get started. Um, beyond that, that's the part of the plan that is still in development. Jana and I have talked already about where the coaches can step in. Um, we also had ideas about using the, we have almost monthly grade level meetings that can become an opportunity for teachers across the grade level from all three buildings to talk about, okay, well, here's the unit I've been working on. Here's what's been working. They can preview units that can help be some of that collaborative support. Um, but Jaina and Rachel also have ongoing conversations with them that as the role of coach will help provide that implementation. The part that's still unknown is once we have a contract with Great Minds to purchase, they also will be able to share with us their recommendations for sound implementation. We really wanna rely on some of their expertise on here's what to expect, here's where we know teachers need more support. So we wanna incorporate that, that expertise as well. So the first professional development is in the fall, right before school starts? Correct, correct. Um, we just, I, I can't require them to come over the summer and we, the team really felt it was important that we have a professional development launch session 
that everyone is expected to attend. I think in the past, there may have been times when that was done over the summer. And so it was an optional thing and it really just didn't set our teachers up for success. So um, there are some digital trainings that we can also make, that will be made available to our staff that they can preview over the summer as well. Just from a pure logistic standpoint, if I do it over the summer, I can't guarantee that every single teacher will get the training that they need to implement successfully. I, I definitely appreciate that it complements foundations because then um, they're not recreating the wheel with a whole new system and exactly. get, getting what a matter of days before exactly. kids are walking into the classroom and they're expected to start, um, you know, knocking out the cobwebs from over the summer and magically get them ready to um, take state tests in a matter of weeks or whatever. Um, I are, are you done, Marguerite? I, didn't want to. Sure. Okay. I wanted to um, first just applaud the fact that um, this uh, recommendation focused on differentiation, something that we have often, often, often talked about and the necessity for it um, while still providing some consistency. That's in line with what I think the Board of Education has been, um, the expectations the board has been setting, not only from our strategic plan, uh, but our expectations for superintendent and, uh, and beyond. I appreciate the efforts that um, it included some diversity components to it as well. Um, I know for a fact that um, my daughter lit up when she saw texts in the library that where she saw herself reflected. Uh, and she is the type of kiddo that would rather see an audio book and never read a pay. And it's so baffling to me because I'm a reader, um, but she hated it. And now she's, she's, she's working on it and seeing great success. Um, I do have a, one quick question um, though. I know you said that the cycle begins again and it's like a five-year cycle. Um, are there plans to have sort of a midpoint evaluation to just sort of see how this is working, if this is going the way we all hope and expect it will, I, you know, because five years feels like a long time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Five years would be when we really do that kind of deep, deep dive, dive where we're thinking ahead to what comes next. Okay. But absolutely, we would want to be gathering information, both in terms of student outcomes and staff feedback and monitoring that implementation along the way so we can know how to course correct. Gotcha. Um, that way we can figure out, do we need additional PD? Does it need to be on a specific topic or a specific component to help support our teachers? Um, do we need to look for some additional text to broaden the differentiation possibility? So yes, the, uh, I know some of you have had an opportunity to talk with me more than others. You know by now I'm a pretty analytical kind of girl. And absolutely, yes, we will be analyzing progress along the whole way because we can't we can't just like to your point, wait five years and then say, oh, okay, it worked or didn't when we probably could have made adjustments beginning in year one and then again in year two to make it the most effective program it can be. Thank you. That's great. I appreciate that was one of my questions and, and really you've done an awesome job of anticipating and answering the questions. I'm really happy to hear that this is something that's going to be solving something that was a problem for our teachers. It sounds like it's it's taking something and, and making it easier instead of asking more. The, the, and so the, the, um, the thoughtfulness that's gone into how this has been um, arrived at is really um, reassuring to me that this, you know, and the results that everybody got to this particular um, program really quickly. And there was so much buy-in. I'm, I'm really excited about the, the work that you've done and the work that you're going to be able to do and that our teachers are going to be able to do. So I appreciate it very much. Great, and I just have one question. We talked about the new dyslexia law. Does this package of materials, will we have to also supplement this new package of materials to meet those? Like, I'm just trying to think how broad these materials are. So foundations will actually target much of the support important and instructional piece, geodes will help reinforce that. Okay. I think the thinking routines that are gonna be starting kindergarten on all the way up into fifth grade will help students develop the academic language they need to really support reading skills. One of the 
biggest components of the dyslexia law is actually screening for dyslexia okay. risk. That will be separate from this. We will have to identify a screener once the ODE determines what is approved as a screener. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to make that as a separate purchase, a separate implementation. Um, that will be more of a screening measure. And then the follow-up to that will be having district and building level committees figuring out how do we support those students. We actually are in a really good spot in that we have more teachers with some of the training that's required mm -hmm. than I anticipated. Um, there will be more required training for our staff. Um, next year, we will focus on training our K-2 teachers. The following year, I believe is, or sorry, it's K-1 and then 2-3 the following year and 4-5 the following year. So there is a sequence of professional development specific to that that the state will have us do, um, but I think it will complement this nicely. Okay. Great. Any other questions for Dr. Boyle? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for the kind of implementation plan and the intermediate kind of uh, assessments you're going to have on how's it going and the rollout for the teachers in August and so forth. So will there also need, need to be some kind of acculturation for the parents Absolutely. and getting them on board and aware of what's going on? Yeah, I think that that would be a really valuable part. If we can either do it in conjunction with curriculum nights at the buildings, or we maybe do something separate. But yes, we will want to introduce families to the materials for several reasons. One, they're going to be seeing some new graphic organizers. Their kids are going to be using some language for thinking routines that may be new to them. We'll want them to become familiar with that because there are ways they can reinforce those thinking right. routines at home. Um, we also will need to make sure they know how to access the materials digitally. I think one of the things we learned during COVID is the digital is valuable, but you need to know how to get to it. And so we'll want to make sure that we can help them access that. Um, every single one of those geodes that we showed, other student texts are available to them digitally. And so we want them to be able to do that. Um, as Dr. Fine mentioned earlier, one of Tyler's final projects was working with Jaina and some of our teachers to, and Rachel Holland to put together a short video about how we teach foundational skills. You actually will get the link to that video in your weekend update. Um, it's also already posted on our website if you ever want to go take a look. But that is actually intended to be the first of a series of videos that the team wants to put together. And it would be very appropriate for us to do a short video as well, introducing families to the program so they can access it at any time. Yeah, thank you for your, your kind of research as well about the maybe pending COVID gap that we may see as other disciplines start to look at their curriculum. We'll see if it persists across courses. It was interesting because I think we initially focused in on our older students that had already been in school prior to COVID. And so we were worried about what they missed during that time. I don't know that we thought early enough about our students who hadn't yet gotten to school and missed out on that preschool experience coming to us. And so we, I think thankfully we have only seen a small dip. Um, I think many of our students' families found ways to provide some of that reading enrichment and, and early literacy experience at home or had other avenues. So I think some of the gaps we saw are not nearly as large as what some of our neighboring districts are experiencing, but it was, when I was looking at the data one day, I'm like, well, oh, wait a minute, that's not the, the trend we want to see. But I think this will help close that before we have any serious gaps to address. Thanks. Wonderful. And Brad said he would love to be the voiceover of the part two of that series. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, uh, it should be Jonathan. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you can use Jonathan to be the voiceover. He does so I, that radio I think. Voice. We're getting off topic here. <laughs> so, Jason, I guess I'm thinking about like we're considering this major investment, right, in, in K-5 um, ELA curriculum. And it sort of brings up two things for me, because what we know for true is to be true is that curriculum matters ish. Right. But matters more is implementation. Mm -hmm. Right. What matters more is what happens in the classroom. Right. Yeah. The actual practice. And that really is a byproduct of really good professional development, right. right? Really good professional learning communities where there are constantly opportunities. And the same financial investment that we put in buying books, yep. we need to invest in offering teachers time to right. work together. And you and I had this conversation yep. Monday. So what 
structures might, and I, this is not a question you have to answer yeah, today, yeah. Yep. but what I'm always, to walk away question, <laughs> um, what opportunities might we put in front of teachers? Because not everybody's going to want to work over the summer, but lots of people are, and they should be compensated for that, right? Like we're asking them to adopt a new curriculum that's going to happen now, and they're going to have to somehow put in place in August. And I would guess that a majority of our teachers are going to spend a lot of time this summer doing that, right? So what, okay, so we know that to be true. So let's create some infrastructures <clears throat> where they can be paid to not just work individually, but also to work together, right? And I think about this huge investment in the ES. So that's one. What does that look like for the K-5 as they sort of navigate this adoption? And then I think, well, we're putting all this money into buying this curriculum for K-5. We do for 6-8 and 9-12, right? Like, I know you're going to talk about it next week. So maybe this is a walkaway question for both of you, right? Like, so we asked those teachers to basically create their own curriculum in many ways, right? On their spare time and their 37 minutes of planning, right? Like the reality is they're doing that on their own time. And so if what we know to be true is professional development or learn, uh, professional learning communities or collaboration is where good, thoughtful instructional planning happens, then let's create opportunities for that to happen. And let's invest as much of our money in the actual planning of how you're gonna teach it as we are investing in the buying of books. Because in the end- People. It, it's what matters, right? Like people have been teaching kids to read for a long time in the absence of that, mm. right? But the way that it happens is in the, the planning and the collaboration. Yeah. And so I would, you know, offer that that be on the May agenda is what opportunities are gonna be available, paid opportunities for educators to implement either the curriculum we're buying or the one that we're asking them to create. Do you have something? Yeah, I do. I do, I agree wholeheartedly with you. I'm making sure that our staff has time to do that. I do wanna just kind of update you a little on the 612 piece. Um, last summer, we actually provided some of those paid opportunities for our 612 teachers to come together to, to do that very thing, because we agree with you that that's absolutely important. Um, the reason you are not seeing a resource purchase for them is because the message that I got back from our 612 teachers was they didn't want a set of, usually a high school, it's more of an anthology. And then they were really clear they didn't want that. But what they did do was look at some of their required and, and optional reading choices and decided we do need to swap out these texts or those. So we have made some smaller purchases based on their needs. They have gotten resources. They weren't to the degree that they needed to be board approved, but um, we wholeheartedly agree with you that we, we need to make sure that they have that time to collaborate. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I do recall though, in the fall, our teachers kind of loudly told us in a nice way, um, and that burnout way um, that PD was feeling like a little overwhelming because of, you know, they, they had PD, they had very little planning time. I mean, did they even get to go to the restroom in a day? You know, I don't know. Like, so I just want to make sure that when we're um, structuring professional development and creating those opportunities that we're not forgetting that they are also telling us from a very human space you know, that's a little too much. Right. Right. I'm suggesting self-directed PD. No, I understand. Um, I, I get it. And, and when we start spending dollars um, that we haven't budgeted for, then we got to ask those questions, you know, do we need to build that into the budget somehow um, going forward so that that self-directed piece doesn't feel like work, but it feel, or even though it's work, they're, they're compensated for their time. I mean, I, I don't expect people to work for free, but at the same time, I'm not a proponent of just, you know, writing a check that we haven't budgeted for. So it's just my two cents. All right. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to thank Colleen, and I love that we've got some superstars in the back with, with Colleen. We are so grateful for the work, lots of work put into this, and a fantastic presentation, very thorough, and, and we're excited for what's ahead. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much to all thank of those you. folks. Um, so, yeah, let's, can we vote on this? Yes. Um, 
I would like to uh, entertain a motion for approval of the purchase of the um, curriculum resource, including both the um, main uh, wit and wisdom piece and the supplement for um, geode. What's it, what was it called? Um, that are that so are both. We'll rename it. <laughs> So moved, so, thank you. Is there a second? second. Um, any further discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. I just need a break. Quick I break. I'm getting that update. You're getting that update. Yeah. Okay, Alicia had told me that she had something going on. She needs. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. So we'll just take a two minute break. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. 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 That's a blessing. <laughs> I just needed to, I could feel my phone go. Um, 
The board welcomes the opportunity to hear from our community members. We encourage your participation within certain parameters. When you come to the microphone, please state your name and address. Our policy requires that you limit your comments to five minutes. Public participation is an opportunity to be heard, but it is not a Q&A session with the board. The president is responsible for the orderly conduct of the meeting and the appropriateness of the subject being presented. Our public participation policy allots five minutes to each person wishing to speak until a total time of 30 minutes is used. Speakers, of course, are not required to take the full five minutes. I don't know that we have more, we don't have more than six people, right? We have one, okay. Um, so please state your name and address and we will put on our five minute timer. Kyle? Ms. Lana Spector, yes. Thank you. Can I request more than five minutes since I'm the only person signed up? That way I can kind of slow down through my presentation. I've always said no to that. And so I'm just gonna stick with our policy. It's, um, you know, we won't haul you off stage, but but we try to build within it because otherwise we've got to adjust that for everybody. And it's just not, you know, fair. And the tips and tricks I've learned is try not to look at the timer. Yes. Because it will make you rush. Yeah, well. I've just seen other people have more than one slot. So um, am I in the right spot for the microphone? Yeah. Okay, it's on? Yeah. Okay. So I'm Alana Spector. I live at 2444 Fair. I'm sorry. Sorry. Terribly, but I still don't like to touch anything that other people have touched. Um, I'm, oh, so you already started on me. Okay, so today I'm here to review the panorama data that was presented to the board. And I realize that most of you weren't on the board at that time, last November by Sam McMasters. I've emailed you some slides, uh, which is what I'm gonna be going through for anybody watching at home. They're out on the buzz, they're out in uh, other places in public, if you wanna follow along. You um, emailed that today, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. uh, so you're uh, taking up my time. No, um, the panorama survey is given twice a year to our students and it records their feelings on sense of belonging and school climate. Uh, this fall, the third slide is the slide that Ms. McMaster's presented. You'll notice that it's unlabeled. And to me and to, I would imagine, the average person looking at it, these numbers look great. 70%, 80%, 90% for sense of belonging. But these numbers aren't real. And there's two things that tell me that. Number one, they all end in a zero. It is highly statistically improbable that across grade bands, the way this test is registered, that they would all end in a zero. On top of that, we have an 80% sense of belonging, favorable sense of belonging for high schoolers. I, I just didn't believe that number and no one asked a single question, so I did. The next slide is the bro breakdown grade level for sense of belonging uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten which test, uh, which testing period this is, for grades six through 12, and I added a line at 80%. You'll see that no grade level, particularly in high school, came anywhere near 80%. So, so what is that number? Well, if you go back and you listen to Ms. McMaster's presentation, you will see that she threw in a bunch of qualifiers. What she said is if you take the raw data, what our students told us about their sense of belonging in our high school, and you compare that to suburban high schools with low incidences of free and reduced lunch that our ranking nationally was 80%. Nobody cares. I don't care where our high school compares with rich suburban high schools. I want to know what our students told us. And what our students told us is very clear. We had 596 high schoolers respond to the survey of that 298 responded with a positive, uh, I'm sorry, a favorable sense of belonging. 298 students did not. Half of the kids that responded to that survey did not have a favorable sense of belonging in our building. That's a very, very different number and a very big problem that we are not addressing. Uh, the next slide that I put in there is the comparison of what was presented, meaning our national rankings, versus the, I'm sorry, I am on the one, number nine. That's no problem. And uh, to be honest with you, the sense of belonging data, the 70, 70, 70, 80 for grades four and five, 
I, I don't know where these numbers came from. They, you would think since it's in the same chart, it would also be showing our national rank, but it isn't. Our national ranking was close to, I think, 90% across those grade bands. And you can see from below that it doesn't match the raw data either. I don't know what these numbers are. I can only assume that they're in error. And I just find that to be like, unacceptable. I don't think that you should accept your administrators coming to the board and presenting data that's just incorrect. There's no calculations involved. You're literally copying numbers. But you can see when you look at the numbers below, the sense of belonging was 49% in the fall and 50% favorable, not 80%. And that's a very different number. So what are you going to take from this? The first is that the data that was presented was at best misleading. I think it was deliberately so. I don't think our community would be happy to hear that half of our high schoolers don't feel that they belong in our buildings. I think that these numbers should have been apparent to their supervisors, her supervisors, and also our building principals. They should know these numbers by heart, up and down. And yet it's been five months and we've heard nothing about any of this. I, I don't understand how the, the administrators, building principals did not look at those numbers and say, that's not right, especially the elementary school because their numbers were underreported. And I think that we need to look more closely at this problem because clearly it's a bigger problem. So what else can you take from this? Recently, our district announced an initiative to look into our special ed services after years and years of complaints from SPED parents about the lack of quality services. Who is leading this initiative? Sam McMasters, the same person that has been responsible for delivering these SPED services for eight years. Clearly, there's a conflict of interest. Clearly, this can't be best practice. She handpicked the committee of the people that would provide input on this committee. I know I received an email in February, I think it was the 24th, saying that the committees were set and I wasn't on it. Uh, nobody that I know was selected. I've asked all of my SPED friends, nobody. I don't know who's on this committee. I can tell you that we did receive a survey asking for input, but what was lacking in this survey is who, if anyone, would be reading it and what that input was going to be used for. How is it going to be used? Without that, it just feels like more gaslighting. You know, we'll, we'll get your input so that you can feel good about giving it, but we're not going to tell you that who, we're even going to look at it or use it. That makes no sense. I think here today, I'm here to ask you for two things. Number one, insist that any district employee that comes to present to the board and to the community shows unfiltered, real, accurate data. It, there's just no excuse for anything less. And, and I think you should even make a consequence because it seems to be a fairly regular thing as from the data that I followed. The second thing I wanna ask you is, I, I want the board to take control of this initiative, the special ed initiative. We need to have an independent body such as ODE or our state support team come in, look at our processes, look at our procedures, look at our IEP, see if they're written appropriately, see if they're written legally. I can tell you from what I've read, I, I would not support that statement. I'm asking you to do a real look because you can't fix a problem if you don't acknowledge it exists. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your coming in. I know the board does. Um, Dr. Fine, I assume that you will look into the discrepancy or the errors, the mistakes, the, the issues that are being raised here and report to us yep. about it. I'll make sure you have a, a report to the board uh, as soon as we dig in. And on all of that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I think that we have no further um, uh, items to come before the board this evening. If that's the case, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. It's so moved. Yes. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, that motion carries. <laughs>